Good afternoon. Uh, this is Thursday, last time I checked, November 2nd. This is a joint meeting of the Education and Culture Committee and the Health and Human Service Committee. Uh, I'm Chair Will Jawando of the Education and Culture Committee. I'm joined by my co-chair, Chair Albernaz, who you hear from shortly, and, and the full committees. Uh, and we have one item today, uh, to a briefing, a very important item, a briefing on our early childhood education initiatives, including presentations from the Children's Opportunity Alliance, from the Department of Health and Human Services, from the County Executive's Office, and the Offices of Management and Budget. Um, and those, I think, the first, we can have folks come forward now. I saw Ms. Otero, Ms. Treadvance, um, I think as Deborah Lambert here, I think I see her. So, and Kim, you come on up. Yeah, fill the seats up. We'll, This is obviously, uh, and we have folks from, is someone from MCPS here as well? Okay, yeah, you can come on, come on down as well. We, uh, this is something that we've worked on uh, for a number of years, obviously a really important imperative for our county. Um, you know, as Montgomery moving forward, so appropriately put it in their call to action back in 2018. And I'm going to quote here, investing in high quality early care and education is the most powerful tool available to overcome barriers to success. It's not the only tool, but it's, there's no better investment a government can make than the education of our youngest. Uh, I know everyone on this council agrees. Um, we are really thankful to the leadership of Councilmember Navarro and her work uh, to set us on a path with the county executive for a multi-year plan to get every one of our 75,000 plus pre-K eligibles ready to go. Um, and so we're, we're eager to hear about uh, as we move into kind of the next phase of the plan, uh, where we are uh, from everybody. Um, so we'll have brief overviews from our uh, council staff first, Ms. Yao, after, we'll first hear from Council Member Avernaz, but then we'll have presentations from each of our panelists and then we will do questions so we can have a robust discussion. Uh, since this is our only item. So really excited about it and uh, turn to my uh, co-chair, Councilman Robbins. Thank you, Chair Juwando. I am excited too. Um, and here's the great news. We've got an extraordinary group of dedicated people who are smart and engaged and caring in trying to address what really has become a crisis. Um, when you look at the kindergarten readiness assessment scores within our elementary schools, they range from 84% to 8 and obviously, uh, we received an update recently from MCPS regarding reading and math test scores for third, fourth, and fifth graders. And we are falling further and further behind, despite all of our best efforts. And we all acknowledge none of us can do this work alone. County government, MCPS, our public sector, our private sector, uh, we must continue to work collaboratively and collectively um, to address what is a complex issue that goes beyond any one agency or organization's ability to be able to address on their own. And so I look forward to the presentations. I know a lot of progress has been made. I know we continue to be in a state of transition as we work through um, the, the, the entities that have been established both by the council in collaboration with the county executive and of course our colleagues in MCPS. Um, but we all have clearly the same objective here and that is to do everything in our power, and I mean everything, to make sure that we support our most vulnerable population and our most important treasure, and that's our children. So I uh, look forward to the presentations. Uh, I'll have some questions and some follow-up, um, but thank you all very much for being here today, and more importantly, your hard work. You're here. Um, and really excited to see the collaboration represented by everyone. Um, the so Ms. Yao will turn to you first to tee us up uh, from the staff perspective, and then we'll go into the presentations. So as turn your mic on, please. I know. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, so as the chairs have said, you know we ha we're going to hear from a number of folks today. The first presentation is going to be on the early care and education initiative that has been um, we're in the first year of the second four-year plan. Um, 
After that, we'll hear a presentation and update from the Children's Opportunity Alliance, who is the designated early care and education coordinating entity in the county. And the third presentation will be from MCPS on the blueprint pillar one, which is on early childhood education. So those are the three um, connected uh, presentations that you'll be hearing today on early care and education. The one point that council staff noted in the packet is there's a whole lot of you know efforts going on in this very important area and so that's really that's a really good thing um, but because we have a lot going on I think the committees may want to discuss how are all these efforts coordinated and how are we making sure that you know our resources are most efficiently used to develop a comprehensive coordinated equitable early care and education system and have all the parties are they are we all working under you know the same definition of system are we are they also you know coordinate in terms of identification prior prioritization of efforts and metrics and how to measure the success of these efforts so that's just the prelude to what you're going to be hearing about thank you that's a great kickoff and actually before we start can we just go down so we can do this now you don't have to do it later just everyone just identify themselves and where they're where they fit in the the pie hi I'm Deborah Lambert I'm from the Office of Management and Budget in the executive staff thank you good morning I'm Deera Treadvance currently serving in the role of Chief of Children Youth and Family Services at the Department of Health and Human Services hello Jennifer Arnais I am the Administrator of Early Childhood Services within DHHS Bibi Otero, uh, Special Assistant to Executive Mark Elrich. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kimberly Rusnak, the Executive Director of the Children's Opportunity Alliance. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Kropp, Director of Pre-K Special Programs and Related Services in the Office of Special Education and MCPS. Good afternoon. Michelle Owens, Director for the Division of Early Childhood, Title I, and Recovery Funds in MCPS. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So who? Uh, ECEI? You got you all the first. So, Deera, okay. Good. Um, is it after? Yes. Good afternoon. <laughs> you can blame COVID for the fog. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much. It is. It is after a little bit of a hiatus. It's so nice to be here. Um, on behalf of Dr. Bridgers, the director of HHS, I want to extend um, his. Uh, welcome hello <laughs> he couldn't join his greetings he couldn't be here today but um, we can assure you you are in good hands with us um, I am joined today by our fantastic team by Miss Jennifer Arnaz and also uh, Miss Bibi Otero and Deborah Lambert we will be presenting to you today um, some of the great work that we have been doing in the early care and education initiative um, the initiative was launched, um, so I know we have a couple of new council members, so I just want to give a brief overview of what the ECI is. The uh, initiative was launched in 2019 in response to the increasing need for coordinated early care and education services with our public, um, with our public agencies. The initiative is a result of a collaboration between the county executive, county council, Montgomery College, and Montgomery County Public Schools. And before we begin, I want to ensure that um, we're all grounded in an understanding of the ECEI's main objectives as it was initially designed. And there are mainly three. The first one is the charge was to identify barriers in the ECE system. The second is designing, co-designing administrative and programmatic solutions to some of these complex issues and implementing policies that prioritize our four pillars, which are alignment, sustainability, access and affordability and expansion to early childhood services so now I will pass it over to my colleague and expert <laughs> Ms. Jennifer Arnaz who's going to walk us through the remainder of the presentation thank you next slide please so I want to as dear has said to a little groundwork in terms of the initiative um, the framework that we've used has really been based on a co-designed effort which is collaboration among stakeholders but really from our community members whether that's early childhood educators families um, we have connected with different organizations advisory panels um, and we've done this through a, a variety of media uh, platforms such as social media we've done town halls we've done Facebook lives we've done um, interviews on radio stations um, in Sintonia within the uh, Latino community um, we've also done um, various forums within our early childhood community to engage find um, what their uh, concerns are and discuss various solutions 
the framework that we've used is um, elevating those concerns to our work groups. We have six different work groups in which we have um, really experts from the field who are engaged in the work of the initiative. They assess, they discuss, they um, inquire with the community and elevate concerns, solutions really, into the steering committee. And the steering committee is really the body of, of agency representation from Montgomery County Public Schools, from Montgomery College, and the county government. So our public agencies are represented, and those who are deeply involved programmatically with these efforts in early care and education um, come together to make elevated recommendations that will directly impact the work that we do within those various agencies. So now we're going to begin um, and really break down the four different um, pillars within uh, the initiative. And I'll start with Bibi. Thank you. Um, you'll remember that we started the initiative five years ago with, with four key areas, and so all of our work has continued to, to sort of align with that. Um, so th speaking of alignment, uh, the first was, uh, was alignment, and, and this is really a, a way to create partnerships and to make sure that uh, we are looking across all of the government organizations and, and departments as well as community um, that are working in this area. I think this is exactly what you were speaking to a little bit earlier. How are we all aligning the work? Um, and so um, we started with a, um, and I know that you've heard a lot about some of these, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to report the progress on this because we got very much derailed by the pandemic. Um, uh, some of these you've seen in our plan for a couple of years. Um, and I, to be honest, I'm, I'm glad that we didn't jump into those uh, because the, the pandemic uh, really has required us to be uh, much more, um, to, to come back and look at some of these uh, areas. So there are, um, six different areas of work that are really about building a comprehensive system and developing the data and the information that we need as we develop any other program or strategy in, in the county. So um, shared services, uh, this is something that everybody has, has it's in the field nationally and shared services is uh, both a way of coordinating efforts for especially family child care and small um, child development centers and it's a way to make sure that we are um, it, it, we're ensuring their financial viability by uh, consolidating some services. Um, so we are in the process of, um, and, and should be completed this, this coming month, um, a shared services process, and we'll do an RFP for uh, an entity or an organization or someone who would be then the hub for shared services for those providers who want to participate. Um, so we haven't defined what the services will be, but we've, they've done a number of, um, uh, focus groups with providers across the, the county to see what they're interested in, whether it's financing or HR or substitutes or what are the areas that they need the most help in. The second is the facilities fund. You've heard us talk about this. Uh, if expansion is part of our requirement and so is quality of, of what our goals are and so is quality, we want to make sure that there we have a fund to which uh, providers can come to and um, be able to access some resources for capital, basically, to be able to either open a new classroom or uh, turn an existing space into an early childhood uh, um, space, or, uh, and we've, we've had several of those. Um, the state has a facilities fund that they developed this past year, so we're tracking who's being funded through those. Are there any gaps? Uh, and then um, uh, how we will be working with a CDFI, a Community Development Investment uh, entity. There are several across the country who have an expertise in working in facilities funds for early care and education. Um, supply and demand, I remember, I'm going to remember uh, Council Member Albert knows last time saying to me, I'm tired of hearing supply and demand, when is that going to happen? Uh, so the supply and demand study is uh, very much, um, we have the contract, we have the folks that are doing the work, and uh, we're very excited that that, uh, that will run through the year, but it is the way by which we will better understand what the true cost of providing care is. Uh, right now, most of cost is, is based on market rate, um, but you want to really understand what is the true cost, and that's what a supply and demand study um, will do. Um, the cost of care, 
um, the, the cost of quality, I'm sorry, the supply and demand is to tell us what's there, what's not there, who needs care, and who, uh, where we might have deserts. The cost of care is to determine the, the true cost of care. And then uh, and a compensation on workforce. The workforce has risen up as probably the most significant issue after the pandemic. Um, we know some of the issues around lack of um, uh, teachers and teachers leaving the work, uh, educators leaving the workforce because of pay, et cetera. So, um, and we are surrounded by counties that are and, and jurisdictions that are really stepping up on this, and we run the risk of losing educators if we don't uh, uh, look at compensation as a really key piece. Um, and finally, evaluating our family involvement centers. We now have three of them, and we want to evaluate and make sure that they are, in fact, providing the services, getting the outcomes that we expect from, from those. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also making sure that there's alignment across, as, as the, the, I think it's been said a couple of times already, across everybody in the county who's doing work in early care and education, uh, including the Children's Opportunity Alliance, the boards and commissions, uh, and community-based organizations. So as, a, as an example, um, Jennifer was talking about the um, various uh, work groups, and so uh, Children's Alliance has a, a representative in every work group and, in fact, is co-chairing uh, one of the work groups. So that's a way of bringing our work together and making sure that we're all understanding what we're all doing. And, of course, dear and Jennifer and I sit on the board of the Children's Alliance. So um, that, that – um, but we want to make sure that this process of aligning is – um, you know, we include leadership in, in, um, in, in the work groups. We're including um, them in the study. So every one of the studies that I just talked about has an expert team that is working with the consultants. And so we've included folks in, from the Alliance and other groups in, uh, as needed in, that, in those expert groups. Um, and we want to make sure that we're coalescing around perspectives and, and approaches and um, that we're asking <clears throat> accessing all of the knowledge and expertise that exists in the county, just as it was said um, uh, earlier. Um, let me just make sure I'm not running into somebody else's uh, work. So um, pass it back to John. Okay. So the second pillar is sustainability. Um, as we move our efforts to create a really robust early care and education system, it's important to recognize this second pillar, especially as we've mentioned before, due to the pandemic, um, child care really took a, a large hit, as they say. Um, within the, our framework, it is pivotal that we, it is important that we were able to pivot to focus on sustainability. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the efforts that we've done um, in FY23 and some of the work that we are looking forward to doing as we move on. Next slide, please. So during the um, during and post pandemic, we successfully addressed uh, child care um, sustainability concerns, such as. Um, providing sustainability grants. Um, we provided PPEs, we gave them access to vaccines, um, as well as um, funding childcare seats for um, essential workers. By ensuring that um, we had these, these, these Support. Supports, yeah, resources available. Um, it really maintained those doors open. Now that we're on the other side of the pandemic, um, we've placed a real priority on continuing to enhance those structural supports. So in, in doing so, we have really bulked up our business consultation, specifically with family child care, um, through contracts and hiring staff so that they can not only help family child care open their businesses as, as you know, entrepreneurs for small businesses in this county, but also to operate their programs successfully and maintain their doors open. We're doing the same efforts now with small centers. Um, enrollment continues to, to be an issue within child care programs. They're averaging between 50 to 75 percent of enrollment. Even at 100 percent capacity, it's still not sustainable for a child care program. So having these business supports to not only help them with marketing, but also budgeting and accessing, um, you know, grants and loans and, and, and the such so that they can continue to operate um, successfully is very primal to us. Um, in addition, we've also provided rent relief to the child care and public space programs. There are 29 child care programs in facilities that are um, monitored by DHHS, and we provided rent relief for those programs throughout FY23 so that they could um, really, uh, you know, 
take care of the children that they had and pay their staff um, equitably. And the other piece that we've also looked at is um, maintaining high quality programming. And so within these child care and public spaces is ensuring that we had funding available for refreshes and updating to not only ensure that they were compliant with regulations and licensing, but also for high quality benchmarks. Next slide. So in addition to child care, it was also very primary for us to support our families and our community. Um, as BB had mentioned, we have the Family Involvement Center. These are opportunities, these centers, there's three now, um, one that was opened up in FY23, uh, located in Rockville, in Gaithersburg, and in Silver Spring. These sites are in collaboration and partnership with various agencies, Department of Recreation and Montgomery County Public Schools. And they're housed in these facilities to provide opportunities for families to engage with their children children um, from birth to five for all abilities. Um, many of our children who are receiving services through infants and toddler um, early intervention, um, they are not in formalized child care and so they're able to participate in these programs and get socialization skills. The um, parent educators that we've hired are not only role modeling how to engage with the children but also providing an opportunity for families to connect and network. Um, these um, are very, uh, as I said, have been very successful throughout the county. The um, third one that opened at the end of FY23, we're very excited about um, how quickly it has been um, accepted in the community uh, with uh, really high numbers. Um, as you can see from the data, we've been able to, to serve really in FY23 about 278 children and 254 families between the three. Next slide, please. Two, two additional projects I wanted to, to mention um, when it comes to our family and community support are Lena Start and The Basics. Lena Start is um, a really critical program that we have continued to fund in FY23 and we continue in FY24. Um, it is an evidence-based um, program uh, that really looks at helping enhance children's communication and engagement. And this is done currently at the Rockville Family Support Center. It's in collaboration with the um, Family uh, Services Inc. or Shepherd Pratt. And um, we have seen high increases, actually about almost four, almost 50% increase of improvement in language development in children birth to four. Um, and as well as um, high parent-child interactions. And we know that the more interaction, the more verbal a child is, the more likely they are to succeed not only in school readiness, but also in life. Um, we will be expanding um, in the next fiscal year the Lena Start program to more than just Rockville right now. We're going to look at um, other sites in Gaithersburg and in Silver Spring. The second um, one is our, the basics, and the basics really, it's, um, it is another critical program that we have continued to fund. It is in partnership with Montgomery Moving Forward and the Montgomery County Collaboration Council. It is a community level initiative to, um, to really provide awareness on uh, child development and early care and education. The effort focused um, this year was is in 20877, and we've had, um, it's more of a messaging campaign uh, to work with not only community members, but businesses as well. Um, they uh, focus on five distinct pillars that help in child development, such as reading, counting, singing, and movement. And um, the, the focus has really been on looking at um, a pay, play, pray approach. So wherever children, parents are paying for a service, are playing with their children or praying in the faith community, that we can access those and provide them information so that they are becoming more aware of um, the importance of those early years and how important it is to read to your child and ask questions afterwards when counting, but it's also comparing. So taking it just a step further in child development. And the other, um, the last area within sustainability that I want to mention was our workforce. The work that we do right now um, to support our early care and education educators um, is twofold. One is uh, with, it, with Montgomery College. We have scholarships at Montgomery College that are helping our providers obtain various credentials whether that is a child development associate, which is 120 clock hours, a one-year certificate, which is 30 credits, um, an AAA or um, a technical degree, or an AA for transfer to a four-year institution. Um, this year, we had invested um, $500,000 to be able to support our providers in pursuing these different credentialing paths. Um, what makes it slightly different, the state also has a career and development fund. Ours, however, does open the doors for individuals who are not necessarily ready for the four credit classes. So whether that's remedial English or math, we pay for those classes to get them leveraged so that they can take those four credit classes. 
Um, in addition, we also um, have been able to provide all of the training that educators need for licensing and for credentialing for free. So all the classes um, have been offered for free to our um, for professional different um, professional development opportunities, um, as well as low cost conferences. Um, we just had our fall conference um, last week with uh, about 250 child care providers participating in that event. Next slide, Bibi. So we'll move to access. Bibi. Sorry. The next area of focus is access and affordability. Um, Again, going back to what is most important for parents and, and, and their children and what they're looking for, uh, we want to provide ease to access and affordable options for families and children, um, in, in primarily in, in, in child care. So um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, we need to prioritize well-being, uh, ensure access to services uh, um, more than ever. The, the initiative has placed a priority in expanding supports to include more families and raising eligibility requirements to meet this critical need. Um, and also to match against the, the uh, eligibility requirements of the state so that we are aligned with the state. Uh, the Working Parent uh, Assistance Program that, as you know, as WPA, that's been around for, for a long time. Um, we've now increased the eligibility to 450% of poverty. Uh, that's aligned with what the state is currently doing. Um, and uh, in 20, 23, we served about 931 children under that, and in 24 to date, we're at 1751. So you can tell that the um, efforts that we've made, well, pro well we're projecting to that. Uh, the, um, the efforts that we're making around uh, getting the word out and getting parents enrolled. And um, I wanted to come back to one of the things that Jennifer just said, which is that enrollment is really down, and that is a national issue right now. Um, there are um, lots of studies and lots of folks across the country looking at why our parents not coming back to child care. Uh, yet we know there's a child care crisis. Um, so this is something that we're keeping an eye on and we're trying to figure out ways that we facilitate for parents. Is it that is it the way we're providing the subsidies or is it um, uh, the hours of service or, or the type of service and how that aligns with parents' work schedules and, and the changes in work. So there's a lot, there are a number of issues around that that uh, we will continue to look at. Uh, so this community outreach and awareness campaign is exactly geared at that, uh, making sure the folks in the community know that we have subsidy that we have uh, access to, to resources and that they can utilize those. And, and it's also about getting providers to accept those subsidies. And so the easier we make for providers to access that and to get reimbursed, the, the more likely that a provider will be willing to take a family that has, uh, that has subsidy. Uh, we also supplemented the SNAP program so that we could serve more children, when, especially during the summer months. Um, so again, looking at this as a systemic approach and not just a specific to child care, what's the system for, for, um, for babies and for young children across the, um, uh, across the county. Uh, next is our innovations and in technology, uh, a couple of different things. One is the early screening project, um, which is working with pediatricians and their families uh, to enhance the um, referrals to early intervention. We want there to be a seamless connection between pediatrician families and those services in, in the infant and toddler program. Um, and then working with the state around the platform to make to, to also make this a uh, easier process for, for families. Um, Community Connect is a very exciting piece. You've seen that in our budget over the last few years. Uh, it is really to create the online portal to simplify access to comprehensive services uh, for, for families, not just child care, but what are all the services that young children need. Um, we want to make sure that we are providing a mechanism by which parents can have one place where they can uh, enroll their children, they can get the information, get the applications, and, and enroll children in our, in our programs. Um, so you'll see more and hear more about that and at, at, at some point probably uh, we'll do a presentation for you um, here. Um, the next piece is expansion. And um, again, we, we've looked at sustainability, alignment, um, uh, access and affordability and expansion is key as we, even though we know that there are there's still vacancies in terms of enrollment, we really need to pay attention to um, expanding childcare, especially 
as we see the results of our supply and demand study. Uh, and where is it that we have childcare deserts and how do we expand those? Um, and so th th we, need, we need to look at multiple settings um, and some of the work that we're currently doing. Um, I really want to let Jennifer talk about Go FCC because that's her baby and she should be recognized because the state has recognized her and, uh, to do that. So you want to talk a little bit about? Sure. So approximately five years ago, we initiated our uh, recruitment efforts for family child care. The number of family child care in Montgomery County has depleted, has declined exponentially. Um, and so um, we put together a uh, really a, a process for obtaining uh, the family child care registration program. The project is called Growing Opportunities in Family Child Care, or Go FCC, and it started with um, really just that recruitment. Um, it is a three-step process that's done within six months um, to the best of our ability um, to be able to move people from the idea of caring for children in their home to really being an entrepreneur um, and operating a family child care business from their home. Um, the, the, the project itself is more than just the educational requirements. We do have um, a healthy dose of business uh, skills that are embedded in, the, pro in the, the project, in the coursework that they're done, consultation. And it's also, we know that the majority of our women, a majority of the family child care providers are women, and they're women of color, black and brown. And so we have a strong piece in there of uh, female empowerment and really helping them to take their business and impact their community. Um, it has grown. It's It's been recognized by the state. Um, the state has, um, I would say, have a 2.0 version of it or a light version of it, similar to ours. Um, we're very fortunate with the resources that we have to be able to invest in business counselors. Um, and the state has taken parts of these and scattered throughout the, I think there's like six jurisdictions that are currently um, doing the the approach and we keep in contact with them and we connect and provide lessons learned. Um, but the, our approach actually has evolved now to uh, the second phase, which is really about sustainability. And there's a piece in there with growing Go FCC that really works on um, obtaining higher benchmarks such as credentialing and excels. And the third phase is about leadership. It's giving back to the community and making our family child care providers their own advocates and leaders within their community. So the the rest of what's uh, um, listed in this um, on in this issue is in this uh, sheet is um, the threes project. We you've heard this before. We have a number of uh, three year olds who have a gap between leaving early Head Start and entering uh, pre K, and, and we want to make sure that that gap is filled. So um, as as three year olds. Um, come out of Early Head Start, uh, we want to make sure that those providers know exactly where they can uh, refer those young children. Uh, Community-based child care expansions, um, Wheaton Site continues to be on the list. We continue to be uh, working with them on, on their RFP and, and, and um, making sure that that, gets, uh, that site gets opened. It's been a long time. Uh, we're also working with a with a provider in Gaithersburg who wants to open another site. So as we get calls from folks who want to open another uh, a child care um, uh, expansion or or open a new site, and this is why going back to the facilities fund, uh, we want to have a coordinated effort and somebody who really knows how to provide um, and how to give providers guidance around construction and renovation and that sort of thing. And a facilities fund uh, operator would be able to do that well. Uh, the equity Equi care grants um, are another mechanism other than WPA that we want to, that we're looking at and that we will um, pilot in come January where rather than individual sort of vouchers that parents get by applying individually to to um, for child care subsidy this would be a grant to a provider for a set number of seats and have the provider be able to recruit families into their program. Uh, we think that that might be a way to get more of our child care uh, providers to be willing to take children who are subsidized. And that has to be our number one priority. Meeting the needs of our lowest income families and children, I think, has got to be our number one priority. Um, the pre-K contract expansion, we currently have one pre-K. This is not the um, state pre-K work. This is all child care programs have three and four year olds um, at the pre-K level. And so we have an, an existing, um, I think about 100 seats that are funded through us, uh, and that's going to move up to about 150 and multiple vendors uh, to support having uh, pre-K in, um, 
in their centers. We hope that that will also help them develop towards entering the, the state pre-K program. Um, so more on that. And then, of course, our partnership with MCPS and all of this. And I, I, I want to make sure to, to note that MCPS is also a partner um, if, in every single one of the committees and every single one of the in the steering committee and, and have been really great partners in terms of that. And we've been able to work together and, um, and share information, ideas, and participate in their own recruitment around uh, pre-K. And so I'll pass it over to them. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, briefly give a historical budget overview of the initiative um, and note that since the inception of the initiative, both the county executive and the county council have provided substantial funding to early care and education. Um, starting in fiscal year 20 with just under $6 million provided in the budget, and that increased to just under $11 million in fiscal year 22, and it's been at uh, roughly $11 million a year in the budget uh, provided for the in initiative since then. And these funds were used to address critical needs um, that have been already described in this presentation. Um, further, uh, additional investments were made to support child care programs during the pandemic. I note two of them on this slide. Uh, these were special appropriations that were uh, provided to the initiative in fiscal year 21. Uh, there was a $10 million child care assistance recovery fund. Uh, as well as a $7.7 .7 million uh, school-age child care special appropriation that was provided in September 2020 uh, to, uh, you know, the, the basic function of these two special appropriations was to uh, assist the providers in navigating the pandemic. And so during the pandemic, uh, those, those pandemic years, uh, the uh, initiative was very much focused on uh, sustainability uh, and, and not so much the expansion and the access um, efforts that had been undertaken prior to the pandemic. Uh, I'd like to uh, point to the actual spending and encumbrances on this chart. Uh, these are actuals for fiscal year 23 noting that the approved budget for the initiative uh, was just under $11 million uh, because of uh, the underspending during the uh, pandemic years. Uh, this uh, particular non-departmental account for early care and education reappropriates any money that is not spent or encumbered during a fiscal year. And so the reappropriation balances um, escalated during the pandemic. Um, and the good news, uh, in terms of fiscal year 23, we actually spent and encumbered uh, a little bit more than was in the budget. So about $300,000 more. So we're, we're working to catch up. Um, in fiscal year 24, uh, we believe that the remaining balance will be less than in fiscal year 23. Um, so we expect the expenditures in fiscal year 24 to range between 17 and $20 million compared to just a little over $11 million actual in fiscal year 23. Um, I'd like to also um, point out in terms of the fiscal year 23 actuals um, and provide like the impact of some of our significant investments in early care and education. This is actual spending unless otherwise noted on this chart. So for example, we spent 3.3 million in WPA and the state supplement. And the impact of that was we served 931 children with WPA. Um, same thing goes with Montgomery College. Uh, that was half a million dollars. And the result of that was that 119 educators received scholarships for um, uh, pursuing professional pathways. Uh, we provided $700,000 in rental assistance for our child care and public space providers. And that allowed 29 programs in public spaces to continue to operate. Uh, we provided 300,000 in uh, personal protective equipment that helped 800 programs receive free supplies so that they can maintain healthy and safe environments. Um, 
the Lena program, as previously described, um, is we only spent thirty-six thousand dollars, but it provided help and assistance for eighty-one families um, in terms of improved child-parent interactions and language development. And then uh, the community portal that has already been described, we've invested $1.3 million in fiscal year 23, and we believe that that is going to be a way for uh, simplified access for parents for not only WPA, but rental assistance, um, child health care, and a myriad of other programs. And so the, the beauty, and I, I have to tell you I love this system as it's being developed. Um, the beauty of the system is so that the parent applies and provides all their documentation once and then it goes to an evaluation of eligibility and within 15 minutes or half an hour you get an assessment of tentative eligibility and so um, you, you don't have to apply for each program individually, and you can apply just once. So we hope that with this kind of an investment, and there's more investments coming for this portal, but we believe that this will be a, a big improvement for parental access to these services. Um, looking ahead to um, our forecast for fiscal year 24, based on what we have spent so far in the first four months, um, as I said before, we expect that 17 million to 20 million in encumbrances and spending will occur during fiscal year 24. We ranged it because there's some uncertainty. Uh, for example, uh, we are assuming that the Quality Child Care Center in Gaithersburg will be implemented. Uh, we are saying we're going to spend that $1 million, but uh, we do know that there are some efforts underway uh, by that provider to work out a partnership. So um, there is a little uncertainty with regard to that spending and whether that will truly happen in fiscal year 24. But we are optimistic. We believe it will be spent. Um, uh, other initiatives that are underway, but with time, timing differences, uh, I believe that the EQUID grant program has already been uh, mentioned. Uh, it, we had assumed when we did the budget that the EQUA grants would begin the beginning of the fiscal year. It's more likely to be in the middle of the fiscal year. So the effort is underway. We just aren't going to spend the money the beginning of the fiscal year. It'll be uh, delayed six to eight months. Um, Community-based Head Start, when we did the budget for this particular program, uh, we had assumed that there was some ARPA funding for it, and we had assumed that the ARPA funding would be spent by the end of fiscal year 23. Based on the spend down of the ARPA funds for this program, it, we now believe that the funding will be spent by the end of March 2024. So as soon as the ARPA funds are spent down, then we will um, be spending down the funding that was budgeted for that program. Um, the Child Care Facility Fund, uh, efforts have been underway. We've been working with a consultant since June of this year. Uh, the consultant for this facility fund uh, will be producing a report. We, it is scheduled to be completed um, by January, and then the expectation is that we would issue an RFP um, that would bring on a community development financial institution that would provide either grants or forgivable loans to child care providers who either want to expand their child care um, or increase the quality of their child care already provided. So um, that is the what we're doing for fiscal year 24 and again you know we are focused on those um, critical needs making the investments in system-wide um, initiatives that will improve uh, supply and quality and access and affordability across the system thank you thank you that's it thank you great yeah <laughs> i wanted to um close it out with with a couple a couple of notions one is that i think really important to understand that the initiative that the initiative um we have made every intention that as much of the dollars go directly to children and go directly to the services to children the foundational studies are really key because they help build the system 
uh, and make sure that we're making decisions based on clear, good data as to what's needed and why and at, at what cost. Um, but it's also really important that we're utilizing our resources as much as possible for families and children. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. A lot, lot there. We're going to hold back and do, do all the questions together. My understanding is that Opportunity Alliance, uh, you have about 15, it'll be shorter than that presentation. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. And same thing with MCPS, right? So, so we're going to power through and we're all writing questions down, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that. So we'll turn it over to you, Ms. Resnick. I timed it this morning. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. Yes. I also just wanted to mention that I believe we have Kevin Beverly joining us virtually. Oh, okay. Mr. Beverly, if you're in there, uh, good, to, good to hear. Are you, are you with us? Okay, well, we, 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 uh, yeah. If you are, hello. There you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, we see you. We... How's everybody? Good to see you. Do you have anything to say before we turn it over to Ms. Resnick? I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. All right, good to have you, Ms. Resnick. Thank you, sir. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so as you know, the Children's Opportunity Alliance was created about a year ago um, by cross-sector community leaders and advocates. Our mission is to bring together community leaders across all sectors who are driven by a common purpose, to create an equitable, comprehensive, high quality, accessible, and sustainable early childhood and education sector and system. Let me start first by applauding you all for creating this organization. The information I will share with you today will underscore its importance, and I say that because we believe that a staggering 82% of our economically disadvantaged children are not being served in our community today. So please bear with me a moment while I kind of break down and unpack that statement. So in Montgomery County, there are approximately 76,000 children who are ages five and under. We know that approximately 56% of these children which is about 42,560 children, are in households living below the self-sufficiency standard in Montgomery County. It's safe to assume that these children's families cannot afford formal pre-K or child care. Of those, approximately 3,350 are receiving state child care scholarships, and for this, the children's ages need to be from birth to age 12. Another 4,300 children are enrolled in MCPS's public pre-K Head Start program, which serves three and four-year-olds. Then there are approximately 1,000 children enrolled in Montgomery County's Working Parents Assistance, WPA. We believe there is also some duplication between the state child care scholarship, WPA, pre-K Head Start, but it is unknown currently what level or number of children are actually duplicative. Sadly, that leaves approximately 35,000 children or a staggering 82% of our youngest children unaccounted for. We know from partnering with the Montgomery County Food Council that there is a SNAP gap, meaning many families with children are not accessing this support. And the state found under-enrollment in free and reduced meals and MCPS students, so the number of families and children that are economically disadvantaged might actually be higher than we know or have data on. I hope you all agree with me that we must find out where these children are and ensure that they get the care and support that they need. I would like to spend the rest of my time today telling you about the things we have learned and what we need to do to move forward and address the needs of the youngest members of our community. First, let me take a quick minute to say that we've accomplished a great deal in the years since we've been established, and my written submission includes more details on that. But I'd rather spend my time today talking to you all about what we've learned what we hope to accomplish, and what are the challenges we're facing so far. All of this in service of ensuring we are working towards an equitable and accessible early care and education system that supports the 35,000 children in need. So, what we have learned so far. We were created by Bill 4221. This enabling reg legislation realized the fragmented nature of our early care and education landscape. Our long-term goals are to make one large system that is number one, easy for families and children to navigate. Secondly, can speak comprehensively around the number of children supported. And lastly, that relies on outcomes and data to determine its impact and effectiveness. To that vein, let me start by sharing six different perspectives with six different quotes that we have heard from community members over the past few months. The first is from a parent. When you're a parent, all you think about is the cost. I was paying more for childcare than my mortgage and bills combined. How is that possible? 
The second is from an early childhood educator. Our programs are hurting. We aren't fully enrolled. We're barely making it. Staff is leaving all the time. We're totally tired and stressed out. We need support in every single area of operating a program. The third is from a community partner. We need to break down the silos. We have a lot of folks in their own sandboxes that should be playing together. The fourth is from the county executives team. Advocacy should be 50 to 60% of the Alliance's budget and work. The fifth is from Montgomery County Public Schools. The blueprint is our North Star. The sixth is from private philanthropy. And this one is hard to share, I think, personally. We are hesitant to invest because we still don't have the faith that this iteration of trying to change the early childhood landscape will lead to impact and results. Our work reminds me of the Indian parable of the blind men and an elephant. There's a group of blind men who have never seen an elephant before. Each man feels a different part of the elephant's body, but only part, the side, the leg, the tusk, the trunk, etc. Then they describe the elephant based upon their experiences and their descriptions are all different. Some come to suspect that the other person is being dishonest because what the other person shares and describes is not their perception of the elephant. The moral of the story is that humans tend to claim absolute truth upon their experience, based upon their experiences and perspective, and we often ignore other people's experiences, which may be equally true. Right now, our ECE system is this elephant. We all have different perspectives based upon where we sit and where we work. And the Children's Opportunity Alliance is really working to take a step back, take a 360 degree view of the entire system and work towards a collective goal of a comprehensive, equitable, high quality, accessible, and sustainable early childhood education system. Here's what we know. Childcare is in crisis. Many families in our community cannot afford childcare or pre-K. Child care providers, early childhood educators, and families want us to move faster towards solutions and strengthening the sector and supports for families. To do so, we must first focus on the workforce challenges. Many community providers are struggling to keep child care open. There are major workforce issues, compensation, qualifications, recruitment, and retention. The economics of running a child care business are not great. Providers have a hard time attracting and retaining qualified staff, wages are barely above minimum wage, and benefit levels are equally poor. Then when you add on certifications or additional education pathways, it is even more challenging because the pathway to higher pay doesn't always exist because the business model limits how much the staff can be paid. We will need innovative solutions to solve these issues. On top of that, you bring in the blueprint. It is here, and it is definitely influencing our system of early care and education. The good news is that it's focused on improving the quality and quantity of early learning opportunities and emphasizing creating a mixed delivery system that will include our community-based providers. The challenging part of it is that it exacerbates the economic issues of the system. So these challenges make it harder for us to meet some of our blueprint goals. In year one, which was last year, every county was supposed to have 35% of the seats be community-based. Montgomery County was able to achieve 11% or 200 children in community-based seats. Child care providers are not running and, and excited to join this program and work. So currently we are reaching out to child care centers and home-based providers to ask them why. What do they know about the blueprint? What are the barriers? What incentives might it take to get them to participate? We have heard anecdotally that some providers do not even know what the blueprint is or understand how it will impact them in the future. Further blueprint requirements um, have led to teachers, the lead teacher needs to have a bachelor's degree and a pre-K to grade three certification, which seems nearly impossible for many community-based providers. And bottom line, the economics of it don't work for most centers. We'll share a full report with our board later this month. So I know this all sounds very doom and gloom, but I am optimistic and we do believe that armed with the right data, some strategic tweaks and funding, and state level advocacy, many of these hurdles can be overcome. But unless we fully understand the scope of the challenge, it's hard to address it. 
So let me now turn to our plans for the coming year. So one, we need to continue to work collectively and collaboratively with DHHS, MCPS, and community-based childcare to increase enrollment in pre-K beyond the current 4,300 children who are enrolled. It would be helpful if we set a goal for this year or next that we could reach the 4,680 students that we were serving in the 2019-2020 school year, which was right before COVID. Secondly, we really need to recognize the value of data. And in order to take a 360 degree view of the system, we need to have a better understanding of the data that currently exists, who's being served and who is not, and to understand the story of services and supports that are currently being implemented in our community. And I will note that collecting and analyzing data will take a lot of persistence and patience, and we are working through data sharing agreements with many different community partners. Lastly, we need to raise awareness in our community about the importance of early learning and the importance of all the growth and development that happens from birth to kindergarten. By now, you've probably realized that we see data as key to unifying and improving the ECE system. But where is the data? Not surprisingly, it is fragmented and spread around the community. Various parts of what we need exist at DHHS, MCPS, MSDE, and Montgomery College, and with child care providers. And some data that we need doesn't currently exist, or at least we have not found it yet. And organizations are hesitant to share it. We understand the privacy concerns and are setting up internal systems and controls in order to manage this. But let me give you an example of why the data is so important. If you go back to the number I shared at the beginning, the 35,000 economically disadvantaged children who are not accessing childcare or pre-K. When we look at that number, it raises questions for us about how many of these children are in, in informal family, friend, or neighbor care. For many families, that works, and it is a culturally desirable option. For some, it doesn't work, and it's simply the lowest cost option, and it causes additional stress. We also know that we live in a community where 74% of our families either have both parents who work or they live in a single parent household. So when we think about this question from a data perspective, we want to look at state scholarships and Montgomery County's working parents assistance to determine by zip code or geographic area how many children are enrolled in registered programs. That information could help us understand where to target outreach, where there might be higher or lower numbers of families using family, friend, or neighbor care. And we can, then we can be innovative about ensuring that the children and families are getting the supports that we need. You would think this data would be easy to access. It is not. In this example, some of it is available, but the owners of the data are hesitant to share it because they are concerned that it will be used for the wrong reasons or that there will be a data breach and the data that should be private will become public. I do completely understand these concerns. And just to let you know, it appears as we've had conversations, each time we request any piece of data from any of our community partners, it's gonna require us to negotiate an MOU with either MCPS, HHS, or partners co-jointly together. We hope that with experience and over time, we can build trust and improve this process. But in the meantime, we just wanna let you know that this is gonna take time and money for us to figure this out. In the long run, armed with data, we can be advocates. We can put equity front and center and lead with transparency. Data will allow us to identify potential innovations and we can work to implement and test solutions and advocate for the solutions that make sense. Obviously doing so will require coordination from the entire community. The good news is we finally have our signed contract with DHHS and a submitted data governance plan. We submitted it last month and we met with DHHS this week. So progress is being made. I wanna close by saying I am a social worker at heart. And as I think about this work, I like to take a strengths-based perspective and think about what are the assets in our community that we have to build upon. We have a strong and passionate county council who cares about children in our community and improving our early care and education system. So thank you. We have a county executive who is a former teacher and a strong advocate for early care and education. We have amazing partners in MCPS and DHHS who are both working very hard to serve children and families in our community. We also have a strong network of child care providers and educators who care deeply about our youngest community members and being able to support and foster their growth and development. 
Many of our challenges, such as access to data, workforce challenges, and leading with equity and transparency are not unique to Montgomery County. We are looking to learn and research best practices from around the country to strengthen our ideas and solutions. I truly believe in the strength of our community. We must listen to our community, engage the Amen. many diverse stakeholders. Oh, Sorry about that. You're, you're not on mute, Mr. Beverly. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we must listen to our community, engage the many stakeholders in our diverse county, and value their lived experiences. The Alliance does not have all the answers, but we trust the collective brilliance of our community to provide us with ideas and solutions. If we're putting equity front and center in our work, we need to lead with transparency, emphasize and lean into co-creation, and develop a unified vision of success. Our team could hunker down for two weeks and sit in a room and develop a strategy and action plans, but we know that is not us centering around equity, inclusion, and co-creation and community voice. So we know all of this community building is taking us a bit longer to get to our end product, but we understand the importance of building relationships, getting buy-in, and coordinating all of these different perspectives, and that is the key to our future success. So going back to the parable, we really are working towards opening everyone's eyes, listening to each other, learning from each other, and working together to put children in our community first. Thank you, Ms. Resnick. That was uh, very, very helpful. Um, and you eat an elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> so, um, and we'll come back. So we'll turn to our MCPS partners for the last presentation, and then we will dive in. And if colleagues, I'm going to turn to the co-chair, but then if other colleagues just flag me and I'll keep in order. Okay, we're ready for our presentation to pop up on the screen. Uh, while that gets started, we are here to provide an update on the implementation of Blueprint Pillar 1, uh, which focuses on three areas within early child care. The first is uh, the area of expansion. And you'll notice on the screen that that is colored in uh, green. And uh, assessment, which is shaded in orange. And then finally, family supports, shaded in blue. Under each of these areas are specific actions for us to complete in order to meet blueprint requirements. Uh, and to the right of the screen, you'll notice some arrows, and that indicates the timeline for implementation. So today, we're going to talk about uh, what MCPS has done to implement Blueprint through those lenses. Next slide, please. We're going to start with the first one, which is to increase the number of high-quality private uh, pre-K providers and staff. Private providers are those uh, which we also call our community partners. And um, the aim of Blueprint is to offer a mixed delivery pre-K. This simply means that parents have a choice. Parents can choose whether they want their children to attend uh, MCPS and use publicly funded pre-K seats, or to work with a private provider who also has publicly funded pre-K seats. In order for a private provider to receive public funds from MSDE, the private provider has to apply for these funds and meet certain criteria. These funds right now come primarily by way of a pre-K expansion grant. Okay, so they have to apply and then they get a response. Um, and this is considered kind of a transition into Blueprint. This slide shows that uh, Montgomery County has seven pre-K private provider partners who have received the grant. That has resulted in a little over 200 publicly funded seats in our private provider settings. MSDE requires MCPS to engage our private providers in consultation as well as in an MOU. And this MOU captures the scope of our partnership. Typically, that provides uh, technical assistance and support with educating students with IEPs, students who are emergent multilingual learners, as well as students who are experiencing homelessness. So to facilitate this, MCPS has created a position uh, for a partnership um, teacher who goes out into the private provider spaces. 
Let me just go back. I just want to make sure I understand the, yes. what this says mm -hmm. to the last slide. So last year there were seven grant programs, mm -hmm. 14 classrooms, 207 students. Yes. This year, seven programs, 19 classrooms, 208 students. Yes. Some of our centers decided to reduce their footprint for the pre-K expansion seats. And they do that for a number of reasons. They could not either fill those seats. Yeah, that's total. That's not additive. That's right. That's the that's total. That's correct. That's not like double. You that know, double is, that number. That's just what's happening in the county right now. That is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. And that's for just to clarify the publicly funded right. seats from M right. MSDA. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure thing. Next slide. So the position that I mentioned on the previous slide supports the implementation of the MOU. Um, and we hold monthly partnership meetings with our pre-K expansion partners. During these meetings, there's a collective engagement around the topics you see on the screen. In particular, professional learning, uh, behavioral expectations. We support our partners through uh, Maryland Excels and accreditation processes. We connect them with child find and special services that may be needed. And we try to support them with reaching 100% capacity. And we do that by also offering uh, time and space when it's pre-K registration time for those partners to come and join us through the registration process. So while we've been able to nurture relationships with seven providers, uh, we would like for more providers, honestly, to take advantage of the state funds. Um, it is a challenge for private providers, and Kimberly has already mentioned some of the things that we've shared with her. Um, and that challenge to apply for funds, it varies, right? The reasons vary. Some of those reasons are because of capacity. There's just not enough people within the pre-K pri private provider space to take time and apply for the grant. There's also an issue related to um, whether it's worth having those publicly funded seats. They have certain requirements, and in some cases, it's a little bit onerous for providers to do the work. And then we also um, have heard that uh, because the businesses are small, it's just a lot to handle even though they want to help children prepare for pre-K. So we've started some solutions and we're, we hope that they pan out. One thing is that we are going to be working with um, partners to any partners that are at level three excels uh, or higher or any providers, excuse me, at level three or higher. We're going to start searching them out, right? We looked for a few last year. We courted them. Uh, to no avail. <laughs> they said, no, no, thank you. But we did help the quality of uh, their program. We also are attempting to connect our existing providers with some alternate pathways to um, their accreditation as well as to um, their staffing issues. And then we are also uh, exploring some partnerships with existing Title I relationships. Uh, within Title I, there is um, a non-public arm, and we are trying to reach out to see if some of our non-public partners might be interested in having pre-K through this opportunity. And then finally, as um, Jennifer and I mentioned, we are, MCPS is a part of the ECI committee, its steering committee, and one of the work groups uh, which we chair is actually responsible for pre-K expansion um, and partnerships. So those are some of the ways we attempt, we're going to attempt to address our uh, high quality private pre-K. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. Okay, so within MCPS, uh, we continue to expand full free day, sorry, free full day <laughs> uh, pre-K for children. And we're doing that by converting part day classes into full day classes. Uh, MCPS started off uh, in around 2004, 2005 with Head Start and some pre-K, and most of them were half day programs. And we actually have some data that shows 
how we have expanded over time. Um, it was about two years ago where we tipped the scale, where we had more full day seats than we do part day seats. So we're really glad about that. And right now our focus is on uh, converting part day seats to full day in our Title I schools. So this year we did that. Um, we identified 10 Title I schools and converted them to full day. When you do this conversion, uh, it means that there's a section that has to be created, right? So you take that section and you create a new full day class or a new part day class in other spaces and that's what we've done because as we convert, we don't want to lose many seats. We want to be able to retain them. As we look toward 24-25, our goal is to continue with the same strategy, convert our part day seats into full day, again with an emphasis on our Title I schools. And we plan to create new full day pre-K classrooms with that conversion. Our expansion includes students with disabilities, and um, I am going to turn this portion of the presentation over to Ms. Kropp, who will discuss inclusion. Thank you. Nichelle Owens and I are lockstep in this work. We believe that students with disabilities at the ages of three and four never is there a more opportune time for them to learn alongside their peers. And in the efforts, because the blueprint requires it and because it's the right thing to do, our goal is to expand services for three and four-year-olds with disabilities to also attend a full-day class alongside their, their non-disabled peers to the greatest extent possible. So three and four-year-old pre-K students receiving special education services through an individualized education program, an IEP, attend currently classes in nearly 60 schools located throughout the clusters um, and also our two early childhood centers one of which is in Silver Spring McDonald Dole Center, which was initiated a, a few years ago with um, support of county council funding and then replicated up county at McDonald Knoll at uh, Emory Grove, the up county early childhood center, where students attend inclusive pre-K classrooms. IEP teams, which include parents as, the, as members, make recommendations for children based on their goals and objectives um, to learn in an inclusive setting full day. Um, and this is regardless of income. So unlike the students in general education, pre-K and Head Start, there is no income eligibility, obviously. This is a federal mandate. Students are served regardless of their income. And we do have some students. There's a continuum of services, a continuum of settings that we're required to have by IDEA, uh, which, requires some which requires us to provide self-contained classrooms for some students should their needs require. So this is absolutely not a one-size-fits-all. IEP teams, including parents, have have options of services along a continuum. And when we have students with disabilities included in general education pre-K classes, what we know is that teachers and classroom staff need greater assistance, greater professional learning to serve all the students because this is, this can be new for them, for them, you know, in their careers. We are committed to professional learning jointly. We plan topics together and we plan, um, joint professional learning so that every teacher and every classroom paraeducator para who's working with children can serve children with disabilities alongside their non-disabled peers, particularly around social emotional development and, and co-teaching and inclusion. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to quantify our enrollment data, we have a chart showing our enrollment as of October 15th, 2023. And this data was prepared for prepared by our Office of Shared Accountability. So it's a little bit lagging. Um, I can speak to more recent data. Um, but what we wanted to highlight was the uh, distribution of our programs between the Head Start and pre-kindergarten office, as well as our special education pre-K options. Um, and you see the age difference. So in general education, pre-K and Head Start, we have a small number of three-year-old classes, right? And uh, most of our classes are for four-year-old children. Um, in our special education space, it's a little bit more balanced, and that makes sense based on the nature of the programs. When we look at our current, our more recent informal data, this is data that our team keeps. That's why we're not showing it on the screen. Um, we are, uh, 
right around 96% full in our Head Start classes. Um, and our full day classes by far are the preferred uh, option for families. They want the full day option. So our full day seats for um, pre-K, we have 1,275 seats filled. And that 1,275 is out of about uh, 1,300. I think it's 1,351. Don't quote me on the exact number, but we're pretty much 92% filled for pre-K. So when we look at those two programs, we are um, we're, we're really looking at full day being the preference, which is why as we move forward, our emphasis will be on creating full day seats. Next slide, please. So one of the things, oh, want back? Right there, thank you. So one of the things that uh, you heard as Kimberly talked and as we have discussed, is this ratio that MSDE has put forward. And they do expect that there is um, eventual equity, 50-50, uh, in pre-K provider, private provider seats and MCPS seats, right? So we wanted to look at it a little bit differently because when the information first came out a few years ago, um, we kept asking, are you asking us to compare all of our pre-K seats to the publicly funded state pre-K seats? Because if you are, that's a disadvantage to MCPS who has invested in Montgomery County, who has invested so much in pre-K along the way that that comparison just didn't make sense to us, right? But we did it because that's what the state says. So what you see where you see all funding is that comparison. And it's a comparison of full day seats, I want to be clear, full day seats, for MCPS, 1951. Full day income eligible, that's what tier one means. And then for private providers, 208. So that ratio is 89 to 11. But MCPS, Montgomery County, we also fund Head Start, which is included in that. So if we pull out Head Start, it's 100% to zero. If we pull out our, the local funds that you all provide, it's 100% to zero. And then if we look at Title I funds that we've used to fund this last round of 10 classes, it's 100% to zero. So then we can look at pre-K expansion and blueprint. When we, when we look at that, we see something a little bit different. It's closer, 57 to 43, right? So if we just look at the state-funded, publicly funded data, uh, then we see more balance versus looking at the whole scope. And I just thought it was worth us seeing that on paper so that we can really see the difference. Next slide, please. One of the things that MSDE is also uh, asking, us to, asking us to do as we expand is to prepare for a sliding scale um, for eligibility into pre-K. Right now, families uh, with 300% poverty or less are admitted to um, our program. But that income eligibility will shift. And as it does, we have to prepare for uh, receiving guidance from MSDE, as well as doing some internal shifts in practice. So uh, we've watched the presentation from the State Board of Education in July. We have a a general understanding, but we are awaiting official guidance. And hopefully, when we um, come back in the spring, we'll be able to give some updates on what that looks like. But we do anticipate having um, a broader scope in our community for pre-K. Okay. Next slide, please. So moving on to the kindergarten readiness assessment. Um, every LEA is charged with administering an unbiased readiness assessment for children when they enter kindergarten. And our data is listed up there. Um, Mr. Albernaz spoke to the data earlier. And uh, you see that 44% of our students demonstrated readiness. This is an assessment that's administered to all uh, roughly 10,000 uh, kindergartners who enter uh, MCPS. 
The data you see here is from September of last year. Uh, we just wrapped up the KRA window, so again, we hope to have some data for you in the future. And it's our expectation that as we create more full-day seats that this data will improve. And it's also our expectation uh, for our supports that we provide to our schools to have an impact on this data. And just to give you an example, um, our teams have instructional specialists who go out to schools and our goal is to honestly provide coaching job embedded coaching, professional learning for our teachers um, to be able to meet these uh, the demands of being in a pre-K classroom with 20 children and really utilizing all of the resources that are available to them. So again, we hope that um, we hope to see an increase in the percentage of students demonstrating readiness. Next slide, please. So this last section is on uh, expanding family supports and there are three indicators here. One is for the state. I just need to be clear. The state uh, was to create 30 new family support centers which they call PADI centers. Um, MCPS does not have any PADI centers at this time and I think part of that's because of the FIC and other strong uh, very early care programs that exist in Montgomery County. But Montgomery County does have two Judy Centers and they are located at Rolling Terrace and Summit Hall Elementary Schools. They serve families um, with very young children. We say birth. Uh, we, have, we have had some moms who come in and they are expecting and we say your, your expecting baby is getting all of this as well. So uh, they really enjoy being able to read and, and hear um, about child development. Uh, in the Judy Centers we offer parent workshops, we offer play groups, we do field trips, there's case management, there are connections to health uh, and educational services. The Infants and Toddlers program falls under Ms. Kropp, so I'm going to let her speak to that. The Infants and Toddlers program, as we know, is a collaboration between MCPS and the Department of Health and Human Services. DHHS is the lead agency. Many of the staff members are MCPS special educators, speech pathologists, and therapists. Uh, and we work very closely with, with the infants and with uh, DHHS, particularly around things we've already talked to, about today, like the Family Involvement Centers, which on any given day, if you go there, there are children and families enrolled in the Infants and Toddlers Program and they're meeting their physical therapist there because they're able to use some of the equipment and some of the, the um, movement activities during the day. They are meeting there with their speech language pathologist and when the Family Involvement Center teachers are reading a book, the, the Infants and Toddlers Provider speech pathologist is kind of coaching the parent on how to do that at home. Um, and it really is a family caregiver coaching model. We've, and we serve children and families from birth to age three when they can opt to come to Montgomery County Public Schools for pre-K services if they are, if they continue to be eligible or they can remain with the parent choice of remaining in the infants and toddlers program until the start of the school year after age four. But this really is our collaboration in terms of outreach, intake, referral, assessment, and services for families and caregivers in a coaching model. So our collaborative partnerships include um, a lot of what you've already heard, <laughs> but for the sake of contextualizing it through our lens, um, we work very closely with DHHS through our Head Start program and um, also in uh, collaboration with Jennifer's team, um, in particular around some social supports that our, our parents uh, take advantage of. As I mentioned, we are, a significant portion of my uh, leadership team is on the early care and education initiatives steering committee and the work groups um, to move forward a lot of these initiatives. And then both Amy and I serve on the board for the Children's Opportunity Alliance. Um, and I think that wraps up our presentation. So we thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Um, that's a that's a lot to take in, uh, and uh, you know really really important. So I'll, I'll ask a couple questions. To turn to Councilman Ravenel as we have. I'm willing to state so.
four thirty or as long as it takes. So, because this is super important, hopefully you're willing to stay as well. Um, we'll see how long it goes. Um, this is something to me. I just a couple comments. This system is completely broken. It's completely broken. I think this is a you know. There's many failures of our capitalistic system. <laughs> this is one of them. And and you are all managing the triage of it. I don't mean our system in particular. I mean the system of childcare in this country is completely broken. Let me be clear. It's absolutely insane. Um, and so I just think we have to say that because we are all managing from that and trying to fill in gaps of a completely ludicrous system. Yeah, and uh, you know, in, so from the fact that we only give three months off in most places or six weeks in the federal government, so you know, in, in countries that it works, you, mom or dad can stay home for a year plus, you, lo you, sh you shorten the window of when this is even needed. Um, but anyway, so I won't go off more on that, but I, I think it's important because we are managing it. We're trying to meet the need of the, the lowest income kids, right? With, but then, but we know from research that when kids are universally together, they're they're going to do better. When when low income and the middle income and high income kids are together, they do better in those programs. But we're we're set to manage saying let's just get our lowest income kids in, in programs. Um, the model for private providers doesn't work. Uh, you know they're the lowest paid. Uh, it's the hardest job um, and so that so when you go to providers and that's gonna be that's gonna be one of my questions and say why don't you want to take this money we're giving we're trying to give you money and they're like no 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 thank you I don't want it it's because it's it's, the models broken it's completely broken so one of the things I would like to embed in any the first question I asked to, to all of you is obviously we control what we control we're not the federal government we can't control you know, setting up that program, we obviously would all want that. But there are states, like our neighbors, there are places where they've taken the reins and said we are going to take care of our, in our case, our 75,000 children. Um, and, we're, and I think we all want to do that. So I would ask that you embed in your answers a, a blue sky approach to how do, we, how do we get there? And I know that's what we're trying to do. Um, so first, my first question is uh, this on the collaboration piece. Uh, you know, we've given a lot of money over the course. You know, Councilman Alvarez and I, have been, have we, and all of us who were here in last council, we were all there. We were very excited to make that first investment. Um, pandemic hit, obviously, something we couldn't control. Uh, I'll start with, because you quoted, um, some colleagues here about what your role is. Is there? Is there? Uh, are you on the same page about what your role is, the entity versus the the government? Because we expect you to be both sides. So I will say, and we are still going through a strategic planning process. But this is part of what we are struggling with with our board: is what is our role, and do we honestly have the fiscal fiduciary capacity to meet all the obligations that are written into the legislation and at the same time there are other initiatives that are doing work that is written into our legislation that we are supposed to be doing which is why we are trying to partner very closely with the ECEI because a lot of what they're doing is what is written into our legislation that we are supposed to be responsible for so I think we're doing our best to navigate the space as a new fledgling one-year-old organization. Um, and we are doing our best to partner with all of the, the programs and entities that exist in this space. But um, I think it's something that we're still trying to grow into. Uh, BB? Turn your mic on, please. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, my background and what I come at early care and education with is a real understanding of the public responsibility for early care and education, just like public education, right? Uh, and really believe that the systems inside of government have to be working together and working in alignment because so many of the systems in government, um, so much of this 
broken national system depends on at least our local systems working with each other, right? Um, and, and, and I talk about meeting the needs of our lowest income children, not in, the, in terms of the segregation of those children into programs, but because our higher income families have some of the resources that they're able to put their children in, in, in child care. And so uh, a perfect example is this, the, these grants, is that the provider has 100% of the children high income parent paid, and you can get a grant for 10 Ten seats in your in your program that are for lower income kids. It really gets to your your point about a mixed system, a system where where all children can can um, um, uh, access regardless of their income of where or where they are. So I think that that's an important piece. Um, so the initiative was set up by the executive and the county council, um, Montgomery College and, and, and uh, MCPS five years ago, specifically to be able to bring systems together across county government and to be able to talk to each other, work with each other, and make sure that we were aligning, that we know what our public spaces uh, policies are, that the, those grants that go out to, uh, not grants, but those RFPs that are going to providers for, to utilize public spaces are consistent across the various the various programs. Um, that um, we are, when we're talking with MCPS about recruitment for pre-K, that we also understand that there are three and four year olds in those community-based organizations, uh, uh, child development centers that are also pre-K age. Uh, and those, and, and the large majority of our three and four year olds, those are the seats they're in. Um, so that kind of, that was the original intent of the of the initiative. One of the things we realized with uh, with developing the initiative, and unfortunately the pandemic came got it, got in our way in a bit, was the lack of data, as it was said. So that's why these foundational pieces of work um, are really critical because in order to find out where are those children and what percentage of those families who are who have children that age group want childcare. Right. Uh, that supply and demand is really, really important. If we're going to look about sustainability for our um, for our child development centers, what do they need? And what is the true cost of care? So that's to the point about what the the initiative is doing. Um, what we've done in the last year, especially with the the alliance coming on board, um, <laughs> but with with others, is to include all of all of those partners in the committees and in the work that's being done within the initiative to make sure that as we develop this data, as we develop this, it's utilized depending on the role that we're all, that we're all playing. Well, I, I appreciate that. And obviously there are things enumerated in the, in the legislation that we passed, right, that some of which you're doing, right? And that, okay, that's what the reality is. So, but at the end of the day, there needs to be, you know, we don't want dupli duplication. Uh, you, whoever's best fit to lead on it should lead on it, and you know, it, you know. Again, I'm, I'm not saying we're going against the law. I, we just want the work to happen. So, sounds like we've made some progress on that, um, but we need to make more. Is that fair? Yes, I would okay. say that's fair. And I think as we, and I know Kevin's got his, his hand up. I'll let him speak next. But I think the other piece is we're moving forward. You know, in a week or two, our board is going to vote on our four goals that we're going to focus on. And, and right now it's looking like access, quality, um, family supports, and workforce. So when we look at ECEI, they already have work groups that are in two out of those four categories, right? So our <laughs> question is, and we'll have this conversation with ECEI, we don't want to create work groups that are doing the same thing that right. you're doing, so how can we join forces around those work groups and bring more people and bodies and knowledge and ideas to that work that's already happening to try to move it along faster? All right, I appreciate that. Go ahead, Kevin, and I have one more question, and I'll turn to colleagues. Well, first, I appreciate the, the question, um, because to me it's an important one. I, I appreciate Kimberly's answer to you. Uh, but the point of all of this is the legislation passed with a set of things that, as a, as a board chair, I focus pretty specifically on how do we address them and then how do we get to a point where we're actually living on the promises that were made. And so if I, if I were to answer your question, honestly, I, my answer is, if I'm looking a year out of what we're doing differently, I would say we're doing nothing differently. We are, we're still in the silos that we're in. The trust within the system is still a big issue. 
uh, between providers and, and county government, between uh, philanthropy and what we're doing and how it interacts with uh, county government. Um, our, our focus, and I think BB alluded to this, the fundamental issue is we believe truly that government has a really big role in this. But if they're not willing to open up this commodity in a different way than we currently open it, then we will not get a result that's any different than the ones we currently have. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the 35,000, you know, I agree the data we have to know, just like we did with uh, disconnected or, you know, for opportunity youth a number of years ago, finding out where these it ended up being like a seven to 10,000 number of where are these kids, 18 to 26, that aren't enrolled in school or aren't working. Um, you know, but it's 22, you know, I have a pre-K child. It's $2,000 a month for my son in pre-K. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, that's the norm, right? That's the norm. So why are people not in it? It's because they can't afford it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the question is, like, not only where are these children, they're definitely in informal care settings, but what do we need to do to get them into slots that are available and get providers? And I know that's all the work you're doing. Last question I have, when you go and talk to people, and I want to hear from MCPS and whoever has the answers, because you've all said versions of it. When you go to someone and say, we have a slot, we have, we have money for you, and, and I, I wrote it down because I couldn't believe it. You said, I think it was you uh, from MCPS, you mentioned this. I, you said that they say, thank you, but no thank you to the expansion for, for what's the why to that? I think I know the answer, but just could you say it? Yeah. So the requirements from MSDE are heavy. They require level three um, at Excel's level three or higher. You're talking about the requirements for the staff? Yes, yeah. for the staff. Um, there's also um, a requirement to um, make sure that you have your your assistant teachers at a CDA or a child development associate and that also is a challenge which is why these partnerships have been set up with Montgomery College um, even in MCPS we're supporting our paraeducators with meeting some of the requirements um, but there's some other things that I think um, I'm still learning about in particular so, so one of our title one partners um, is associated with a religious school and uh, MSDE does have some very clear systems in place of if you receive state funding mm -hmm. there are things you can't do religiously right. yeah. which takes a significant portion of uh, systems that are prime for pre-k right they have the it's a whole school yeah. right they're right off the table so, um, you know, when I look around, I'm starting to hear that more explicitly shared, um, and that's not something that I heard previously. Uh, so, again, I'm asking questions, we're learning, but um, I think most of the reasons is it's just not worth it to receive uh, those state funds. I think one of, one of the, um, I totally agree with everything Shelda said, um, one of the things you'll find when we do the cost of care is what it really costs to provide a service to a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a two-year-old. Um, what you will find is that reimbursement from the state is way below. Uh, the latest cost of care that was done in, the, in D.C. that really, I think, reflects the region is $34,000 a year for uh, infants and toddlers. Um, it's closer to 24 for uh, preschoolers. Yeah. It's 14 what the state reimburses. So at the same time as you are required to have a bachelor's degree certified teacher, you're getting $14,000. So how do you supplement that with what funds when in fact the school system, nothing against the school system, but the school system has an infrastructure that supports its pre-K? Right. Uh, and maybe receive, uh, so it's receiving a, a lot more per child. So it's not an even or an equitable partnership to expect, to expect this from a, and as a past provider, if I'm running a three and four year old classroom at high quality and I know, and I'm doing it well and I've got curriculum, my teachers are really good, why should I shift to a state underfunded right. classroom? Right. And so that's, I think, where the certification certainly is a huge issue. The funding is a huge issue. If you offer $24,000 a year, yeah, 
which is what I'm, which is factors out to what I'm paying. So that's the cost. <laughs> we want a list of you. We're getting ready to go into session for January for the in, the, in Annapolis. Yep. This process has to yield mm -hmm. a list of things that we need to go to our partners mm -hmm. to to change. We've talked about this before. Like we have thir a third of our residents are foreign born. You know, we have all these folks that are providing informal care settings. So whether it's the qualifications, obviously the amount of reimbursement, it was a money issue, all those things, we need to, as the biggest county, we need to be really pushing that, uh, and we need your help developing that list. So, and I think uh, you you heard the me the meeting that um, uh, we just recently had with the executive and 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 um, uh, the alliance and and us. Um, that was his call exactly. He basically asked. He said, "Go to the state." get some of these things changed and get the funding. Uh, the state needs to change the policies. The, that, that's not at our, in our control, right? And so that was a very clear uh, um, ask from, uh, from the alliance, from the from executive. Well, and, and I will say, I think in, in previous board meetings, when we had previous conversations around either COA staff doing advocacy or us funding advocacy organizations, there were members of our board who expressed hesitation around us using county funds from either HHS, the county executive's office, or MCPS to do state or county level advocacy. But hearing it from you today that that is part of what you would like us to do, that definitely gives us the green light to be able to have greater flexibility to use those dollars to be able to do that kind of advocacy. So thank you for raising that. You're welcome. Councilman Robinson. Oh, man. Um, let's see. So I'm going to channel my colleague and friend, Councilmember Navarro, and I've been following the bouncing ball, not just in this session, but frankly, over the last 16 years working in county government. And so um, we all really sense the urgency here because we all feel this imperative moral obligation to do right by, again, our children, um, our most precious asset. Um, but there are some real societal impacts that we also have to acknowledge. We received an uh, update this morning in HHS. There's a, been a precipitous decline in birth rate in Montgomery County. And as we learned in an aging summit last week, for the first time in the history of our country, by 2035, older adults will outnumber children based on U.S. Census. And the number one reason people are not having more children listed on surveys across the board is cost. And we know that, we feel it, we acknowledge it, we're living and breathing that, we're experiencing that personally um, with children, ourselves. And we all understand, you know, as Chair Jawando mentioned, we all acknowledge this is a, a broken system, to say the least. Um, for a little bit more context and background, Councilmember Navarro was very supportive, both of ECEI, which she frankly gave birth to. It was in her office that I remember her bringing me in. It was one of my first meetings as a council member. And she showed me this three-page strategic plan and blueprint document that essentially established ECEI. And then she went and met with BB and members of the administration, and there was a collaborative effort to launch it. She was also incredibly supportive of the Children's Opportunity Alliance because she understood and recognized, as I do, having been in government for 16 years, that administrations change, initiatives change. They come and they go, they peter out. But what needs to be there is an entity that helps coordinate this very complex world that will outlast all of us. And that is why we created the Children's Opportunity Alliance. And I want to acknowledge the board members who are here, um, who have been on this journey with us, uh, including Kevin Beverly, and also the incredible public officials that have been working on this issue day and night, particularly through HHS and MCPS. But it's just important to remind all of us that you know we're all trying to do the same thing here. So with that as context, you know one of the, the stipulations um, was that there be representation in work groups. Um, which is great, but it's clear to me that's not enough. Um, because being in a work group does not automatically mean you will authentically be in a position to be able to actively participate in the work group that you are showing up for. Um, and it, it also doesn't take into account that, you know, that there's people are coming at these work groups from different angles and different perspectives and different experiences. And I credit ECEI for 
trying to move the ball forward, getting programs off the ground, the portal is tremendously exciting uh, because that clearly is something that we need to establish and work through and work on. But we need MOUs. We need something in writing that confirms exactly who's on first. Um, now that we are this far into this process, so that inevitably when this administration changes, and it's going to change, inevitably when all of us on this dais change, and we're all going to change at some point, that there be some level of consistency so that the people who are feeling the elephant um, can actually see it. So I think that's going to be really important. And, and I would strongly recommend, and I know MOUs are tough, I get it, um, but it would be worth the time and investment where we are now um, to be able to establish some, some clear direction for everybody, because I think it will make it easier for everyone moving forward. So I'd, I'd like to strongly recommend that. Um, with regards to MCPS, I'll start with you. It's just sort of a logisticals question, but the issue of space within our schools, just the actual footprint. So let's say, best case scenario, you know, we get all this right in five years. Um, what, from a capital perspective, are, 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 have you conducted in an assessment of, of where we are and what that might look like? I'll start to answer, um, but you know I live in a pre-K space and uh, I, I know we have our chief academic officer here in case um, I don't speak to everything. So I'll start by saying every year we engage with our um, Department of Facilities and Capital Management, Mr. Adams' team, and um, just to see where the space is for pre-K. We've been in contact with them every year to talk about pre-K expansion. You know, we, we knew we were going to full day. So uh, more recently, we've conducted a more thorough view of where we have space in the district. And um, we believe that with the sliding scale, we'll be able to go into communities where um, transportation won't be a barrier and families can be closer to their homes. Um, because there's something to be said about that 300 to 600 percent scale. I want to quantify it for you a bit. Um, right now, 300 percent poverty is $90,000 for a family of four. That means that 600 percent is 180000 for a family of four. If you put two, I'm just going to name teachers because that's what I know. If you put two teachers who are married, they have young children, um, they could possibly be earning right around that uh, together less than 180000 You put a pre-K in their community, they're able to save the $2,000 per month and pay on a sliding scale and take advantage of seats that we have in MCPS. So that's a long-term vision, right, for us to be able to fill seats and go into spaces where we currently are, are not. Uh, most of our spaces are in areas where there are high percentages of families who are um, living in poverty. Um, the other thing that we've done is that in speaking with Mr. Adams' team, we have started talking about more early childhood centers that don't just serve 100 to 120. We're talking about building it out into a school, right? 300 children to scale, provide the appropriate supports. And if we have three centers with 300 children, then we're talking 900 seats, which again, allows for more expansion. So from a capital planning perspective, that's what we've done so far. Um, I don't know, Dr. Pugh, you want to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whether that, that wraps it up, or is there more you want to add? I'll just add one thing. Sure. She did a great job for a bit from a pre-K lens. So good afternoon. Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer. Um, in our conversations, we created the five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan and what that would look like mathematically, um, starting with what it would cost for teachers. And then we met with facilities and transportation to say, okay, what are the facilities and capital costs? When you look at the CIP, which is just going through process now, um, we need to line up with what the CIP is because CIP is a long-term plan, right? 
So instead of it being an even number of classrooms added each year, which to us made perfect sense, in order to line up with what the CIP has in it, it will be sufficient for this first year and for the second year and will line up when school, new schools are created and then we have space in existing buildings right now. So yes, we are thinking about the capacity. It would be, in, in Mr. Adams' estimate, it is like building six elementary schools in five years, hmm. which just doesn't happen quickly. No, definitely not. Thank you. That, that, um, that's helpful. Um, just last question for now, and I might go back in the queue, but um, so the issue of data collection, um, you know, everybody's acknowledged it at some point. Ms. Rusnick, you a very good summary. Um, you know, we have information, it's fragmented, and we're missing it in certain areas. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, and and I, we asked for this in a follow-up in HHS this morning um, is, a follow-up specifically on data analysis and I think we need to follow up on that and, and have a longer conversation on what that might look like and I'd love for the group collectively to come up with some recommendations and an assessment of where the data is currently being collected where we agree that there are holes in the system and what specifically we need the state or the federal government's help with in order for us to be able to provide as complete a picture as we're ever going to get so um, in a follow-up, I'd like to suggest that you all work collaboratively to provide us with that information. With that, I yield back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I just want to clear something up on the advocacy. I was saying I want a list from you all collectively to us. You, should, you are not to be spending, I would agree with the board members that would say that you shouldn't be hiring a lobby firm to go at, be in Annapolis or whatever. You know, I, so, I don't know what you were saying, but I just wanted to I wasn't clear. necessarily saying we're going to hire a lobby firm to go do that, but what we've also heard is part of advocacy is raising awareness in community and encouraging community absolutely. to speak yeah, up absolutely. about what are the needs and and one of the questions we asked of all of you which i found really interesting was are you hearing from your community that child care is not affordable and many of you said no you're not constituents are not calling your office and saying i can't afford child care even though we know most likely they I just think they, they've accepted it exactly <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just think, and they think there's nothing can be done. I think it's more fatalistic than anything yeah, else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, so yes, we need communities to be crying for what they need, absolutely. Yes. And you, you have a role in that for sure. Yes. But we still want our list so we can engage in yes. our everything. We're going to start this process where we support, we send priorities letters, we support things. You know, we need to make sure this, in my mind, this needs to be a big part of it. Yes. I'll go to Council Member Lukey. Thank you. And, and, and as you and I discussed, certainly I spent a, a fair amount of time resigned to that inevitability of, you know, basically my entire paycheck going out the door to cover child care for having three children, four and under, right? And that was a substantial amount of time. And when the last one got on the kindergarten bus, hallelujah, right? And so, you, you know, you may talk about it amongst yourselves and you talk about it amongst your neighbors and then when they are finally school aged, you, you sort of do those kinship care things that we've discussed because that's the way you make a neighborhood work and I know that happens here. Um, but it's, it's tough and it's only gotten worse over time. I say that as my youngest turns 12 on, on Saturday. Um, uh, thank you for raising the issue of, of expanding the building so you can provide these services in one facility. Um, that's another ongoing complaint that parents have with early childhood care. You may have siblings, but you can't always get two spots in one place. Um, and so you or you have an infant who needs care and has to go one place or there's no room at the end so grandma comes to help out but that's temporary and we can't get everybody in in one spot um, so certainly having the threes and fours programs running in one facility will be a will be a, a help um, I know we've talked about data and, and we've you and I have talked about data specifically a lot one of the issues with determining or discerning how many children are currently receiving threes and fours cares in private facilities is there isn't an ability for the government to collect that information. Um, and so the state does have the information on the public school provided threes and fours care, but they won't ever have it and they because Trust me, I tried to negotiate that. What could we do? How could we make this work within the legal frameworks that we have? And the answer would be it would require an agreement with each independent facility. It would require consent of all the parents. Um, and so it's just a different 
uh, animal, if you will, than those who are receiving um, threes and fours care uh, education within the public school system. But there is that data that is available for those who have been going through the public um, programs. And uh, you did talk about the, and you had the slide about the kindergarten readiness assessment. Was that slide um, just showing for Montgomery County, or was that an overall uh, statewide KRA assessment? That's just for Montgomery County. Okay. And was there a change in the KRA assessment um, over the past year or two? Because I believe in the past it was a sample, and I think now it's more across the board. Am yeah. I correct? Yes. Okay. Right. All right. It's a I, census delivery of the all right. assessment. I had to make a note for myself because I'm like, I think I remember, but I'm never quite sure. Um, and in terms of the blueprint and the and the plan for, you know, what we call universal pre-K, is to allow access for everyone who wants to be able to do it. But it doesn't include a mandate that you must enroll. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So for for individuals who you know may say, hey, I only want the religiously affiliated programming that does you know X Y and Z and that won't take the state dollars and isn't go that's where I want my kids to go they can still do that yes. um, without any issue and understandably I know there are a lot of issues with the state funding of those um, of programs at those facilities some of those came up during my time at the state including facilities um, who had accepted state funding and acknowledged the all the bells and whistles that come in there about non-discrimination, but then, you know, if you had two moms, moms from muffins was not for you, and they were trying to preclude parents from actively participating in their child's um, school programs, and that's unacceptable. Um, so in terms of the MOU, as Council Member Abernas, uh discussed, like we really are at a point where we need a what to whom by when kind of roadmap, knowing that of course it may change and be reevaluated over time. Um, but it is really critical that we get something like that, not just for historical knowledge for you know several councils down the road, but also to show sometimes just the mere attempt at doing it shows you where the legal roadblocks are or where there are um, systemic impediments to getting to the goals you're trying to get to. Um, and so where where do you see that how do you see that process playing out and what do you think you all could do to collaborate to get us to something tangible like that I think the um, one piece of it is obviously the uh, COA's um, strategic plan uh, and what gets laid out in terms of the strategic plan because mm -hmm. uh, the initiatives mandate is pretty clear in terms of systems organizing internal to government in particular, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in in that process, obviously, the um, the initiative has um, taken a lot of initiatives <laughs> in, in that process of, of being the, mm -hmm. um, the, again, over the last five years, right? The, so um, as we look at the strategic plan and we look at where either, you know, more collaboration within some of these committees or outcomes, I think the other piece is utilization of the data we're going to get out of these various studies. I think that, for example, the supply and demand study might give us some data mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that we haven't been able to get from the state, for example. My, my experience having done other supply and demand studies are, are real eye-openers um, right. in terms of where you have to organize because there's not enough child care, where you have to invest because there's not enough, and, and really what is that demand from parents um, who actually want child care and, and, and want um, and, and the other is the age groups, right? Right, um, right. Being really clear that even though you may have 11,000 or so children per age group, uh, there may be a much lower number who want uh, infant care in the center base, but they want family right. child care. Right. Um, so that, that kind of discerning some of that, hopefully the supply and demand study, get, it won't answer all of those, but mm -hmm. it gets us to an additional set of questions which we can then divvy up and decide how we how we address them. Um, some are some are systemic issues within government. Some might 
may very well be things that are much more around mobilizing community in order in order to be able to um, um, to respond to what we learn in some of these. Um, I think the other one is this this issue of cost. Right. We don't we don't know enough about what that is, and we know a lot of anecdotes. Everybody everybody has an experience with the children they raised, mm -hmm. they raised right? Um, and I think it's going to be really, really important for, to be grounded on what it truly costs to, to whether it is in a subsidized building, right. it's still, the, the cost is still there, right. or whether it is in a, in a for-profit or a non-profit or family child care, and then really making some clear countywide decisions about investments. Um, in, in, and of course, we know that what, one of the things that will come out of that is that around 80% of the cost is staff. Right. Um, and then if that's the case, what we go back to this workforce issue, what's our compensation strategy? And you cannot, we've now seen that across the country, you cannot put the compensation piece on simply the parent the fees fee right. or the subsidies. Right. And right. where compensation has been successful is creating a compensation fund that supplements or provides, uh, and we see that in, um, you know, San Francisco has, a, has an amazing program around that. We see that in Colorado. We see that in D.C. around the mm -hmm. corner mm -hmm. where they've put a wealth tax in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that wealth tax has provided $178 uh, million dollars and it's created an equity fund that then funds providers to be able to meet um, compensation at the level of public education and creates that there, that equitable piece. So, right. again, to your question about collaboration, is once we have a bit more of this data on our uh, in our hands, I think we can divvy up the work in a way that makes sense um, uh, between uh, all the various players mm -hmm, that are mm -hmm. that are here. Um, and and you know, I, I want to answer one of the questions around the work groups. Mm -hmm. The work groups are really. Uh, the way that we've developed the work throughout this. And it has been that input from the work groups to the steering committee that has then developed the strategies that we've done. So they are really critical in terms of having the right people in those work groups and the, and the right expertise. So on that point, though, how do you reconcile each work group's work together? Who, who the, steering com the steering committee, the steering committee yes. is the steering handling committee that. Is, yeah. Okay. And so uh, the the co-chairs of mm -hmm. all the work groups make up the steering committee. Gotcha. And so we look at cross-cutting issues, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, they make recommendations to the finance committee in terms of what funding they think they need the following year. Um, they um, And the steering committee then takes that information and we've had work groups, we've had, um, I'm sorry, not work groups, but uh, community forums mm -hmm. where we take that mm -hmm. information back to the community and say this is what the work groups have come up with. Uh, what do you think? And we've added things that the community has asked for and, and sort of try to do some level of co-design. The pandemic really set us yeah. back a lot on this, but that's, yeah. that's the way the work and the initiative has been working up to now. And I, I mean, and I know the pandemic set back the child care centers um, in terms of, you know, a child care center based on the ratios, based on the staffing needs and all of that, the money where you can make up some of the money, if you will, tended to be with the threes and fours classrooms, not with not with your infants and toddlers, and yet you have less people returning to center-based care. And I think the, the the other issue here that I want to highlight is, um, as pre-K pre is critical, and three and four-year-old pre-K public education, it's the trend that's where we're going. Um, but we have to keep in mind the impact that it has on infants and toddlers mm -hmm. and the availability, accessibility, cost, mm -hmm. because, you know, child development centers balance their books based yep. on how many children they have at each age group, including before and after school. Right. Um, if you're running a, one of the things we see happening in some jurisdictions, the district being one of them, is that more and more child development centers are simply serving one, two, and three-year-olds, mm -hmm. and most, and then three-year-olds and four-year-olds are primarily in the public sector, in, in public schools and in, in public charter schools. That then means that the operation for that provider is much, much more expensive. Yeah, yeah. So that we need to, we need, and this is what I, lo I love the fact that the blueprint expects a 50 percent, but it has to be not on the backs of our infants and toddlers. Right, right. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Council Member, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for allowing me to sit in and, and join. Um, first of all, I appreciate Council Member Joanna starting off with the system being completely broken. It is absolutely, undeniably, completely broken. Uh, and Maryland is a big problem. Uh, you know, we're, we're not one of the best, we're one of the worst. And that's just the reality. And I think we need to own up to that. There have been some recent advances uh, at the state level, uh, thanks in large part to some leadership by our uh, own Montgomery County delegation. But the subsidies are way too low. The requirements are way too high. The support system is virtually non-existent. It doesn't work. I mean, we, you know, when we're trailing Alabama, Mississippi, and other states not exactly known for their social safety net and their powerhouse public education and social support system, I mean, you know, we have a problem, and you know, we need to acknowledge that. And appreciate uh, Chair Albernaz uh, echoing our former colleague, Nancy Navarro. I, too, sat in her office and looked at that uh, report. And you know, I think it's important to note that uh, she and the previous council were involved in both the initiative and the alliance. And so the idea that these two things are not working together the way that I believe that they should is a problem. And we need to fix that. These were not separate ideas that came out of separate places for separate purposes that are trying to be reconciled. These were two different entities and approaches that were supposed to work layered on top of one another like a hand fitting into a glove. And uh, you know, the, the right hand is in the left glove or something because uh, it's clear it's, it's just not working to the extent that it, 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 it should be in terms of the coordination. And I think uh, today, is an example of that. You know, I think everybody is working extremely hard, and I think everybody cares deeply about these issues. But we had sep three separate presentations that did not necessarily exactly align to one another. And that should speak volumes to the firewalls that have been placed between the different entities that are trying to tackle this problem. And the whole intention of both the uh, legislation and the ECEI effort was to break down those barriers and to have more coordination and, and collaboration. So, uh, you know, I believe we're all on the same team here. I'm just not sure we're using the same playbook, and I'm not sure we have a clear understanding of who's playing what position. And I think we have to clarify that. And so, I, you know, I appreciate the the points about an MOU. Uh, you know, I don't really care what it is. If we have to go back and redo the bill, let's go back and redo the bill. If we have to, you know, push for an MOU, let's push for an MOU. I mean, who cares what the way to get about this? But there has to be a commitment to actually do it. And uh, to me, um, it doesn't feel like we have one set of data that everybody is using. It doesn't feel like we have one plan that everybody is executing. It doesn't feel like we have one clear path that everybody is on working together hand in hand uh, to move forward and uh, you know it, it, it does uh, feel like we, we aren't doing the work to create the systems to serve people and it's it feels like there's a little bit of back and forth about control and not about kids and I don't think it's intentional but I think that is the situation that we're, we're in and I think it is present in the conversation that we're having so uh, in that light um, my, my first question from Ms. Otero, what is your view of what the role is of the uh, Children's Opportunity Alliance vis-a-vis -vis ECI, vis-a-vis -vis HHS and MCPS? Like, like, expl explain to me as if I'm supposed to explain it to constituents because we're spending their money, $27 million to one, a million to another, because we've got you know tens of thousands of children we're supposed to be attempting to serve. How would you explain it of, of whose role is what, who does what, how it breaks down? So is the question around the existing structure the way they are, or is it about the ideal? Well, I believe it should be about the existing structure as it is today and what we are all working towards, like what, what your vision is of what we're working towards and, and when that would be. So there's, there's definitely duplication between the legislation and the mandate of, from the executive and the council to the ECI. There's no question about that. Um, we should resolve that issue. Um, in an ideal world, in, in terms of how 
at least the work I've done nationally and locally uh, on this issue, is that there is a real need for a external body that really does do the work that we've been talking about that moves policy at a state level in particular. So many of the issues that we've talked about have to do with the state. Uh, when uh, Councilman Rwanda talks about the, the state and the, and the federal, we can't do anything about it, not necessarily true. There is a CD, CCDF, which is the block grant at the federal level that the state runs the plan, writes the plan. We need to have an input on that plan. We need to know what's in that plan. We're the largest jurisdiction. We should have a say in that plan and make sure that the federal funds that are coming to the state meet the needs of what we need in Montgomery County for our, for our children and for our families. So there's a huge piece there. Uh, the regulatory pieces are done by the state. There's a huge need there. Uh, the blueprint comes up and does not, as it, from my perspective, does not um, align with child care and child care regulations in any way. And so when you look at that blueprint, it is, we're all trying to fit two things in that don't, we have child care on one end, we have public pre-K, uh, and then we have a lot of three and four year olds okay. that so, are on one or the other. So, so I just want to break so this down. Me, so so is, it, is it a policy role? I mean, it I sounds think, like what you're saying is you think the outside entity should be focused on state policy and that county government should do what county government's been doing forever. I think is that I mean I just want to make sure I'm cutting through and I understanding is, what you're what you're advocating I, and for. And I think Kimberly talked about this. It is how do we get the voices of the community um, out? How do we organize around parents, uh, providers, to make sure that you have the voices of the community uh, rising up so that we do have we have less control at a county level, right? The, the state has a lot more. So moving some of that, moving the investment, the county is never going to be able to have the dollars to make the kind of investment we need either for universal pre-K or for accessible early care and education for the large number of, of, of families that we have. We, we need to advocate for much stronger state funding. Can I ask a follow-up? Mm -hmm. what, what is your view of what should have changed, has changed, or will change as a result of the passage of the bill that created an outside entity in terms of service load because you're talking about things that we've never done before we haven't really done that level of concerted advocacy so you're suggesting that this organization that was set up to do something I think totally differently from what you've shared uh, that might have been part of it, it might have been a small piece of it but certainly wasn't the core of, of any of the discussions that I was part of should focus on that and I just trying to understand is, is your view that county government and county government public partners should continue doing exactly what we've done because it, it seems like that's what mr. Beverly was saying that we're continuing doing exactly what we've always done not much has changed and I just want to is that is that a is that a feature or is that a bug I mean that, that's essentially what I'm trying to understand here like is, is that is that intentional so, or is that not I mean, where we want to be I was not in the in the in the development of the legislation, so I can't tell you which pieces were. Uh, you know, we didn't, I have the legislation. I've looked at it. I still, I do think that the piece that was really missing in the county was that level of advocacy, um, I'm, and I'm using the word advocacy in a very broad. Way. It is organizing. I'm a great believer as an organizer that you have to organize community around the needs of community. Uh, that you have to organize a community voice, and you've got to move that in in in. in um, in, a, in a coordinated effort towards a couple of very strategic goals. I think that's the only way we've seen in states across, across the country where there has been movement in this issue uh, for, for significant funding. Whether you look at New Mexico and their land grant around early care and education, or you look at Oregon and the work that they've done, uh, it, is, it has been community moving, moving a lot of that work. Um, and providers all, all, all together. So I think the, the um, I do believe the data piece is a really critical piece of work and, and it's a really critical piece of work that uh, I think uh, combining data from all of the different places is a really important piece of work. It tells a story and it tells a story that supports the advocacy in a very significant way. Um, the, the county has, unlike any other county I think in the, in the state, has an HHS, an early childhood office, that has a mandate to do a significant number of work and 
has created the ECEI to organize the work of, I think, Dira said at the very beginning uh, of the presentation that our, our job is to organize the work of government and government agencies so that there isn't a level of duplication uh, and there's coordination and alignment around that that serves a community. That. Okay, I have one, one last follow-up question for you, and then I have a question for CO, and then I'll, I'll yield back if that's okay, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the indulgence. You mentioned earlier about the work groups and the steering committee about getting community engagement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who, who is responsible for that? Because the bill seems very clear that the Children's Opportunity Alliance would be responsible. Like, the whole purpose of setting it up is to have a community voice right. in the conversations. Exactly. But it seems that ECEI is getting that community well, voice. Remember, so I'm just, I just, I'm trying to understand from your perspective, like who's responsible for that piece? But remember, we started five years ago, and so obviously there was no alliance five years ago. There was, as we were working, doing the work of ECI. Obviously, we were, um, we were uh, ensuring that we were getting the the community voices. If there is a different mechanism to get those community voices, I think that absolutely makes sense. But. But the bill is clear. I mean, I just I, the, the 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 challenge that I have mm -hmm. is respectfully the idea of well, we've been doing it for five years, so we're going to continue doing that, it that, is not an adequate answer because the bill was passed for a reason to create an entity for a reason, and the idea that well, there's overlap here, so we need to sort that out. The bill designated it, so the idea that there was a there was a pre-existing mandate. The mandate is in the bill that was approved by the county council and was signed by the county agree, executive to make very clear of who would be responsible for certain actions. And so it's, it's just, it's a little confusing to me because it, it, it feels like there is direction, but the direction is not being but, but, followed. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to understand why. I, I did not say continue. I said we were filling that gap over the last five years. The alliance has been in place for a year. It's been in the process of organizing itself. If we have to, if we reach a point, if there is a point at which that's the role that the alliance plays in terms of organizing community, great. I think we. But is we, that your idea of how it's supposed to work and how you're intending for it to work and what the department is I moving think, forward and the ECEI is moving forward to facilitate working? I, I'm just there, those are because those I are two different just, things. One is to say, yeah, sure, if they figure it out eventually, if we're comfortable, we'll turn it over to them if we feel like they can do it. The other view is, yeah, we're working together hand in hand to transition what we were doing in the ECEI to what we expect the alliance to do. And here are the three things that they're doing, and here are the three things that we're doing, and here are the two things that MCPS is doing, and here are the other things that, you know. And that doesn't any, feel like it's happening in the extent, and I think you're hearing it from other colleagues too. Yeah, and I am, and I, and I realize that and I, I, I'm respectful of the fact that Kimberly has said they're finishing up, the, the, the alliance is finishing up a strategic plan. We then need to really look at how all those, the work of the ECI and the strategic plan aligned. Yeah, Absolutely. I think, and I'll finish on, on, the concern is their work and your work and MCBS's work are all happening separately. And it doesn't feel like there is the level of coordination that I think was envisioned in the passage of the bill and that has been envisioned, frankly, when ECI was done, it was always known that a public-private entity was going to be moving forward. Montgomery moving forward and other efforts had already been well established at that point. Several of us, I mean, I, when I talked to Councilmember Navarro when we originally talked about that initiative, the idea was always to move towards that legislation, but it was not ready yet. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, so, so these things are not uh, not doing it. I, I would love to hear, and, and I can. Uh, we don't have to hear it today if you're not ready, but. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I appreciate it, Ms. Rusnick, uh, blueprint being the North Star. And I understand there's some challenges with regulatory dynamics, but the question is there's a community side of blueprint and there is a, a, a public side of blueprint. And I think we've combined them a lot of times, but I think we should at times disaggregate them to really understand what the needs are. Do you have an idea of what the cost would be on just the community side, the, the, the non-public side of fulfilling the blueprint requirements? Because we, we focus a lot on what the public cost needs would be, which is important, but I think we need to talk also about the private side, and then I'll yield back after you respond. 
Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. So um, I think it's part of the conversations we've been having with MCPS um, is they've done the cost model of what it will cost to build that out within MCPS system for them to serve more children. But I think we're, we're starting to do that cost model. It is written into the legislation that we are to do fiscal mapping and cost modeling. And so we actually do have a staff member who is our strategic public financing coordinator who is building out that cost model now. And what we've actually looked at is the ECEI initiative has the cost of care study and the supply and demand that are currently going out and sending surveys out and gathering data. So once we have that data back from that, we should be able to pull together a cost model and then be able to compare it to what MCPS is looking at, but I think to what BB talked about already, one of the key factors we know is that state level reimbursement rate is very low. And so when we get that cost of care um, study back, we'll be able to state, okay, here's what Montgomery County needs to provide as incentive to providers to encourage them to participate in the process and in the blueprint implementation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Council Member Mink. Thank you. Um, thank you all for the work that you're doing in this very important space. Um, but I will just say that I have found this very confusing. I would have hoped and expected, especially given the legislation that was passed by the previous council, that as Council Member Friedson noted, we would have seen one presentation today that brought together everybody's information under the umbrella of here are the number of children that we are trying to serve. Here's where we are reaching them and in what way. Here's where they're located geographically. Here's demographic information. Um, here's linguistic information. Here's what schools they feed into. All the information that would allow us to better understand where we're succeeding exactly and where we are failing exactly and, um, and by what degree. And because the data that we saw today was a relatively limited, frankly, in terms of actual data points, um, and also not compiled, it's very hard to, to really put that picture together. And so as we think about being responsible with taxpayers' money, we, like we are responsible for being able to answer that question. There are many millions of dollars in this space, and I am unable to clearly articulate to taxpayers at this point what exactly we're getting for that. We've heard about a lot of different positive things happening here and there, and like everybody's doing good stuff, but we need to be able to articulate with clarity what exactly the, the product is and how that compares to our overall goals, and be able to compare like which initiatives are working particularly well and in what areas and, and with what communities. Everybody's trying different stuff, and it, that's, a, that's a good thing because it, you would hope that that would allow us to figure out what we should be putting more time and energy and money into, but if everybody's doing their things separately and we're not ultimately sharing data and information, um, then we are missing, then everybody's just kind of like throwing darts out there. Um, so it just it does, does not feel like a responsible use of taxpayer funds at the moment, given the lack of coordination and communication, which I think is, again, why that bill was passed by the previous council. Um, so if there was going to be one presentation that brought together everybody's information that had all of the data in it, who would be making that presentation? Anybody have an opinion on that? I think it's a, it's a combined effort because I do think that the, the, the county as the public entity has a responsibility to, to uh, put together the work that that is doing within government definitely okay. so a combined um, effort is everybody sharing their data then if it's going to be a combined effort that means like we're all sitting together exactly. we're all looking at the data we are all going to sit down and, and figure Absolutely. out what this means and put it to, okay so that means that everybody's data needs to be shared mm -hmm. with each other yes sorry I've been Okay. It's, it's been a game of double dutch and I haven't been able to get in here. I just want to clarify a couple of things because my, my heart is racing as I'm hearing this conversation. To, to the community that is listening, I want to clarify that we need to separate the issues. We are not each other's enemies. We're here to transform a system that has existed way before anybody on this table. We did not create it. We are trying to dismantle it. And this system is bigger than anybody on this table. 
to Jennifer, uh, to sorry, to, to Kimberly's analogy of the elephant, I want the community to know whatever we have presented on today is huge stuff and I do not want that to not be celebrated. We are transforming the system. We are doing a lot of different change. We're eating the leg of the elephant. Somebody else is eating the other leg. Somebody else is, is we're, we're trying to eat the elephant one piece at a time. Just because there's incoherence with a legislation doesn't mean that systems change effort is not happening. So I want to clarify that because there are moms, dads, and people in the community. I'm a mom. Listening to this, my heart would sink if I hear this conversation. We are doing the work. We're just a little unorganized because politics trumped practice. We have a legislation that in an effort to try to create coherence, it created a little bit more incoherence. And then we have other players who are also tackling early care. There's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. Incoherence, is, it's, it's to be expected when you're doing systems practice. So the system is working exactly as it was designed to do, as it was designed to, to work. So a couple of things I do want to say. I want to clarify that as HHS, not speaking on behalf of anybody, just from HHS, our work as government is bigger than just the ECEI. If we're talking about systems, it's not just ECEI. We do infants and toddlers. We do a lot of other things with providers. So if we're truly talking about systems change effort, could we please focus on that? Because when you look at the system, there's upstream, there's downstream. There's plenty of work for everybody to do here. Sustainability, alignment, all of that is only one piece of the pie. We're not talking about addressing social and institutional inequities, right? This isn't just about early care. This is about family systems that are fragmented. It's about income inequality. This is about developmental disabilities. Children with developmental disabilities, where are they in this narrative and in this conversation? What about racial equity? I'm a mother that at three years old, my daughter in a child care center experienced racism from another child, from teachers, and the list keeps going. We, there's so much to do in this system. There are so many Lego pieces. <laughs> this is just a fragment of it. Other bodies of work from HHS is another fragment. If we could just please let the practice trump the politics. I just really wanted to clarify that because I feel like the community needs to know, I work for you, we all work for you, council works for you, we're trying the best that we can. It's a space where, and I, I would forever remember council member, member Navarro's words to me. She said, you're walking into a county where we have a lot of rich assets, but there's a lot of misalignment and incoherence. And everybody, we have a lot of players who showed up with their tools to build the thing, right? but we're all sort of a little bit disorganized. We're maybe dismantling a little bit what somebody else is doing or building here without a blueprint for our collective work. And that's all we need to do. And I think we need to create the clarity that we are not seeing, and that means letting go, and that means imagining something new, because there is a lot of work to do in this system, not just in the, in the ECI's area. There's so much that is unrepresented in our conversations. So thank you for, I just want, I, I could not not say that. So thank, thank you, you for your framing. Thank I mean, I, my intent is actually not to say anything different than that. I don't dispute that we have a lot of dedicated people doing a lot of hard work all across this very complex space. My concern is with, the, as, as you mentioned, there is so much going on we're a huge county with a lot of kids and a lot of needs and a lot of diversity within those needs and a lot of people who are working on all different kinds of spaces um, uh, you know that match their area of, of specialty or, or whatever has been tasked to them or you know there's there, as you mentioned there's a lot going on in this space in order to understand where our misses are, where our successes are, where the needs still are, where we need to be channeling more funding and more attention and all of that. We need to better understand how, where everybody fits within the larger picture. So, and, and I think that allows, that allows us to give everybody the credit and the kudos that they deserve more easily as well than if everybody's kind of just saying, we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this. What we and what the public need to understand is Here's everybody that we're trying to meet in this particular goal, early childhood, care and education, and here's who's doing what, and that's very, very complicated. 
obviously. But it's data that we need and that my understanding from reading the bill that the previous council passed was that the the COA was a um, you know was an attempt to put an entity into place that's going to help and and bring that information to the surface and, and bring it together. Um, and so my concern is that that legislation was passed, but we're still not seeing the data framed that way. And it sounds like in part it's because the in, the data is not being shared amongst everybody, right? Everybody would benefit from having everybody else's data about who they're serving and in what way and who they're targeting next and all of those sorts of things. And then we do need somebody who is getting everybody's data and has the capacity to, um, to, to put that together into something meaningful so everybody can then sit down together and look at it and figure out like where should we go from here. And so my question is, the legislation from, my, from the way I read it, says that the Children's Opportunity Alliance is who is supposed to be helping to hold that in partnership with everybody who's in the space. Does everybody ag agree that that is a good use for the COA, or is, there, is this just like a, a fundamental disagreement between this branch and the executive branch, and we really just need to like sit down and figure and figure that out. Um, and is there a path forward at this time, given that everybody in front of us has a shared goal and has significant expertise and heart in this area? I don't want to waste time with the politics and the going back and forth and and, the, and all of that. C can we? Can you all? Please share the data with each other, with us, and come together with something that it, everybody doesn't need, like separate strategic plans that are talking about, that are purporting to talk to the whole. We, there's one whole picture and it includes everybody. That's what's going to be the most useful thing. So, I, for example, our. MCPS, does MCPS have any concerns about the sharing of data? And I ask that because um, Ms. Owens or Ms. Crap, I don't remember who it was, mentioned that the pre-K seats are 96% full, but that's internal data. And I'm like, that's exactly the data that I would like. Why would that be internal data? I want that to be the whole presentation. Which seats are, are how many seats is that exactly? And who is providing them and where? Um, like, let's dig into that some more. And so when you no noted that it was internal data, is that because you thought, we wouldn't be interested, or is that data that MCPS is hesitant to share? Or yes, we just haven't checked it. That, that's honestly, a, it's we're we're a team, and our OSA, our Office of Shared Accountability, who normally confirms data, makes sure it's official. Our data had not leveled up to them yet. So when I say internal, I mean that um, honestly, I haven't gone through and double-checked everything that that's all it means okay yeah so you're totally fine with sharing the because what I what we don't want to hear is that like we can't put this graph together because we can't get the data that we need from this entity or that entity about who exactly is providing these services how many seats are there where are they located how many students are enrolled at this time um, you know if and I have heard that so that's something that we we need to be resolved. And yes, MOUs, da 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 da. But like, it it just it the, I just am am concerned that we need some kind of written agreement now to move forward about who's gonna for every little piece of data. Um, I mean, yeah. speaking of politics, so, like let's just yeah. So I can respond on behalf of HHS as Kimberly had alluded in her in her. Um, presentation, we have finalized our data use agreement so that we could share. And so that was that that is a process and there's a legality to that. Mm -hmm. So within HHS that agreement has been completed, having met with our um, risk management and with data compliance so that we can freely share with each other. So that is correct. that this week, correct? So but it is a process and I think that needs to be understood as well, the legalities behind sh data sharing, safeguarding data. We have a lot of confidential information that we want to make sure it remains confidential and private. So from HHS's perspective, yes, that's now finalized and we can do that freely. And I'll say the same for MCPS. We are in the process of reviewing the scope of work so that we can share data. Um, you know, student data is protected and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing with the data. I mean, 
once we got clearance to share information, we freely shared with Kimberly. And a lot of the information that she shared in her presentation and the report is from uh, information shared by MCPS. Thank you. I, um, I was aware of that, I, so I wasn't understanding where that mm -hmm. data piece was, was coming, because I think it does make sense to have a, a centralized way to, to collect our data. I do, I do want to put a caveat in, and that is the state data. Uh, a great mm -hmm. deal of the data that we need is state level data right. um, and health data. It's both. Health is protected in lots of ways. We have, we have care for kids. We have a number of things where it would be really helpful to get the data. We have the new ma um, maternity program at the state level that gives a much broader access for um, uh, for pregnant women to uh, to services under a Medicaid-like program. That data would be phenomenal in terms of our of our babies, right? Um, the and I talk from, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from experience I did many years ago, I did the strategic plan for Montgomery County for early care and education. And it was almost impossible to get the data from the state as to who's being served, how many kids, what the licensing is, uh, what, it, what enrollment versus capacity is, and, and all of that. So just wanting to be, that piece is also going to be really key because um, the state holds all of that information. Um, it also holds the information around teachers and educators, and the lack of a state registry for uh, for educators makes it very, very hard to understand who's who's there to provide the services for kids. So. Thank you. Thank you. Let me. I just want to because of time. I want to make sure we get to Councilmember Sales, and then if. if it, time left I'll go to other colleagues that want to make another point. Councilmember Sales. Thank you Mr. Chair and thank you all for being here today to discuss the tremendous benefits of early childhood um, uh, education initiatives uh, especially for our most vulnerable students. Um, a lot has been mentioned and a lot of questions have been asked. I wanted to ask about some of these studies um, Across all of these three entities, how many studies have been conducted since 2019? Do we have a number of studies each entity has conducted? Because I know COA, you're proposing several more studies in the upcoming fiscal year in your report with the next step, so. So the only studies that we're working on right now we're doing, um, we're talking to providers to um, hear about the blueprint and understanding why they're not opting into the system. Um, the only other study that we're working on is fiscal mapping, and that is required as part of the legislation. There was a study about salaries um, that was mentioned. So we're not doing the salary study. That's ECEI. Okay. So, so yeah, I think it would be helpful mm -hmm. to figure out how many studies have been conducted and what are we doing with all that data across these three entities um, and what studies are being proposed coming up. If you don't have those answers, in terms of now. ECI, mm -hmm. it's the I can't remember which uh, which slide it was that that gives slide you the five list of, slide five on slide there. five gives you the list of w and and what state they're in. Yeah, um, everything was actually postponed due to the pandemic, and so now that they're we're on the other side now, everything has been released, and so we actively worked on getting these out. They're in some yes, it was ECEI. Yes. See, even we're confused. I'm confused. So I see it. It's actually on page two. Ongoing work that underpins the development of a comprehensive ECE system includes a study on supply and demand of child care, study on cost of quality child care, study on early childhood and education, compensation and workforce. So there's a lot of studies that have been done and some that are coming, or is this, this is done? The, these, are the, these are all in a process right now, and we have put it the completion dates there as well. Okay. So they're in a, either the beginning, the middle, or towards the end. But and they'll I, be done this fiscal And year. I want to clarify that it's not duplicative to what COA is doing, because COA is at the table with us, and that's what BB was alluding to earlier, that we are planning on sharing that data collectively okay. once those studies are done, for us to better organize ourselves more strategically once we know what exactly is there. I, I'm, I'm a public servant, again, public health by trade, one of the first things to do in a public health approach is to characterize the problem. We need a clear definition of what is it that we want to fix in the context of Montgomery County. And the collection of these studies will help us with that strategy and that alignment in the future. 
I completely agree. And so I think before this panel comes back before the council that we do have an MOU and a clear understanding based on the data that's yielded from these results about what the path is moving forward and what role each entity is going to play um, in that part. Um, I had another question about the uh, work groups and how these work groups are measuring success across the work groups. So we've, we've, the ECI has worked with, the work groups have been a key part from the very beginning. And so the, the, in response to your question, the way the work groups group, they, they are formed by experts or folks from the community that the chairs bring into the work group. They don't, they, they're pretty open in terms of that. Um, they, re, they review the work for that particular work group. Um, the, the part of the reason we came up with all these studies is because each of the work groups have, we don't have information about this. We mm -hmm. don't know, we don't know where the, for example, we don't know where the child care deserts are, so we don't know where to emphasize uh, um, greater expansion or putting, or resources for expansion, et cetera. So a lot of the outcomes of what happened those, at the beginning with the work groups was, was getting some of this data developed through these, uh, through these studies. Again, I think we'd be much further along if it hadn't been the pandemic, because we literally took two years to pivot to sustainability with the pandemic. And so, um, the, but a lot of the gaps that were identified by the work groups that first year or two mm -hmm. is what you're seeing right now in the, in the work. Uh, some of the, the projects that um, Jennifer spoke about, the, the LENA and BASICS and others, mm -hmm. come out of recommendations of the work groups of where we needed to do some investments. The family invo involvement centers are another. We have a lot of um, caregivers and parents who are home with children um, who need a place to be able to go to and both get the services from, um, um, inter for, from the intervention services as well as um, a place where there's a lot of concern about caregivers having the skill sets mm -hmm. uh, as they are taking care of children in a home. And so these parent involvement centers are a place where they, there's a classroom setting and they can come in and, and get some skills. So some of, much of what you see in our, in what you heard today, both in terms of some of the, what's been done and what's going to be done, it has to do with what's come out of the work groups. I mean, the whole idea is to work in a, in a sort of a co-design model, not to have two or three of us sit around the table and decide what needs to be done. Uh, I don't know if that completely answers your question. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think I was just trying to determine um, if these work groups were creating the baseline data to implement some of these programs or if the work group is proposing the studies that are underway just so the work groups the work groups by and large at the very beginning really identified a lot of gaps mm -hmm. um, the various studies have a um, group of folks working with the consultants as local experts um, we've worked jointly on that and and MC, uh, MCPS and some of them and so that if you've got for example we we bring in a consultant to do the supply and demand study, the, um, that consultant has a team uh, that comes out of not just ACI but, but others that are working with them to make sure that that study really responds to what we need in Montgomery County. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So, so it's a combination. Okay. Okay. Um, are we assessing um, where these programs should be implemented in the county? You mentioned the Family Involvement Center, Lena, the Basics, Wheaton Child Care. How are we determining where these programs are being offered? So the initial recommendation was to have them closely located to um, infant and toddler um, sites. So there are five throughout the county and we have three set up already. We're actually in the um, 
process of getting an evaluation done on the evaluating the family involvement centers to see mm -hmm. what successes, what benchmarks they've re reached, as well as assessing location for future um, locations and perhaps other delivery methods as well that would okay. best serve the county. So I can't answer completely, but we are in this evaluation. That's one of the, I think it's the last evaluation they see on the studies. Perfect. Yeah. Also during, uh, one of the things that uh, during the pandemic was very clear is that there are some key zip codes where the, the needs are greatest, right? And mm -hmm. so um, as we look at, um, for example, once the um, facilities fund is in place, how do we prioritize? Because we're not going to have enough money for, for everybody. We're, you know, looking at, at uh, once we have the recommendation for the prioritizing in, in those zip codes based on the supply and demand study, where are the, where are the uh, deserts, the child care deserts in the county? Um, what are the key zip codes? Where, who are the, um, uh, the expansion is that infants and toddlers or pre-K, where do we need it the most mm -hmm. in that particular? So it's utilizing all of that, all of that data that we'll, we have or we will have. Okay. Um, as we do these studies. Um, okay. this, uh, that's why I think this foundational pieces are really critical because yes. they really will help make some long-term decisions. Definitely. Even in terms of the decision by the public school system um, as it talks about um, expansion of, of early childhood sites, mm -hmm. that supply and demand study should be able to really either um, coincide with what already the school system knows or provide some new data or some new information around that? Yes, I, I totally agree. And um, thinking about um, those efforts, um, there was a mention of staffing shortages. We already know that we are short educators. Um, we have even less paraeducators. Um, but I see half a million dollars was spent to um, train uh, new childhood, um, early childhood uh, educators. Um, was there a residency requirement? Are they required to work here in Montgomery County or? Sorry. The half a million dollars were for scholarships specific to Montgomery College to yeah. either to pursue a credentialing pathway. The requirement is that they are working in a Montgomery County facility. Okay. Not so much a residency that you live in okay. Montgomery County, but working here because yeah. it impacts. Um, and that they are, as I said, employed in a registered child care mm -hmm. and pursuing one of the five tracks. Okay. Um, those tracks will help them to either pursue higher education if they want to go to a four-year degree or can get them a CDA so they can work as an assistant or an aide. Um, separately from that, we've also alleviated all the, the, the costs for required training. Licensing requires training. Um, just as in, to understand the investment there, um, to become a family child care provider, Initially, it's about 48 hours of training. Um, to work in a center as a lead teacher, it's about 90 hours and plus some. So the investment, those costs can be quite burdensome to many other providers. So we've been able to alleviate those, those burdens to the provider so that they can find professional development opportunities that will allow them to meet the next level in their path. And I know we have some early childhood education classes at MCPS already. You know, Gapisburg High School has um, a, a course where you can get, I believe, half of those hours. Um, are there any efforts to expand seats at the high school level to offset some of those costs? I'm going to let my <coughs> MCPS yeah. answer. Sure. We actually have started talking to um, our our supervisor who's responsible for the child development program mm -hmm. in MCPS about that. Um, we have not moved forward with anything yet, but a lot of this is aligned to the blueprint. It's also aligned to creating some uh, creative spaces <laughs> where children can, I call them children because they're 17, but they're I guess children. they're not really children, I don't know. They are still um, children. Where our high schoolers can work with directly with um, our early learners and have an opportunity to practice some of the things that they're learning in their child development classes. So right now it's an idea and talking phase with the hopes of having something more concrete in the future. Yeah, we, we definitely need to make sure that if we are talking about building up capacity, we start with the least expensive route and that's starting with MCPS and those workforce pipelines. Um, and then I had a question about the uh, Working Parent Assistance Scholarship. Is that an unlimited fund? And it would be nice, right? 
I Do we know how many families? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, we have yes, applied and um, what the... Uh, yeah, so for FY23, we had supported 931 children through mm -hmm. WPA supplement um, or WPA directly. Yeah. Um, and then for this year, we're projecting um, 1,751. Yes, I, I was wondering how many applied, how many were denied, and what the resources are. What What's the fund I, amount? So, so yeah, we could get you that data. Okay. But one point that I do want to uh, make is that we have been having a lot of internal conversations to reevaluate WPA mm. because work, right? A lot. We're in a post-COVID world, government is different, we're being asked to do more with less, families are struggling, work doesn't mean what it meant before, and we, if we want to talk about equity, we need to acknowledge the inequalities that exist in the workspace. Particularly, we have a large influx of migrants coming in who are unable to access work um, because they don't have access to childcare, and they can't... It's like the chicken or the egg issue. So I do, we can get you that data, but there are efforts going on internally to reevaluate where could we remove our own structurally violent practices and reimagine something new for where families and communities are at in a post-COVID world. And, and that's what the grants come into place. Yes. It's, it's, our, it's kind of our test pilot for, to see whether through a grant process rather than an individual voucher process it, it, would, it would provide uh, greater access. But the other piece is also one that uh, um, Kimberly alluded to, and that is that um, the, the duplication with the state scholarships and the WPA, yeah. um, there is duplication because the state bases their subsidy reimbursements on the market rate. Mm. Uh, which then means it is at a lower reimbursement than what the true cost would be. And so parents end up having to pay a huge amount on top of whatever it is that they're subsidized. So they may be eligible for subsidy for the state and uh, still not be able to use that subsidy because they can't afford to pay the balance. And so we're using, we have used a lot of, as the state has increased its eligibility, uh, which it's done a really good job in the last three years. It was it was very very low, and they really moved up. Um, we have then supplemented the state the state scholarship with WPA, and so there is duplication between the state subsidy the state scholarship as the state calls it and WPA, so that those parents uh, can can actually utilize what they get approved for. Um, so so you'll see some of that in the in the data, but that's. Some of that is data we've got to pull from the state, and that's where yeah. it's hard. Well, we are here to be your partners, and I just appreciate all of the work. I know that this is not an easy topic to discuss, um, but at the end of the day, we're doing this for our children. And so I just want us all to be mindful of why we are all here and that we are here to ensure that our children, our most vulnerable children, get the best early childhood education experience possible to ensure that they can reach self-sufficiency when they leave MCPS and should they choose to stay in our community. And I hope we keep all of that in mind as we think about an MOU to come back and have strategies on how to move forward collectively together. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. I'll, I'll have some comments at the end, but I'll turn to my co-chair first. Thanks. Um, so just some comments to sort of wrap us up as we head towards the end here. Um, I know this has been awkward, um, but it's important, and I felt that this has actually been very productive um, and in a variety of different ways. Um, I'll go back to where I started, which is that we're all committed to this work. We're all coming at it from different angles. We all have different spheres of influence that we're trying to align and put together so that we're all rowing in the same direction, clear direction with strategy. And um, it wasn't about politics, Ms. Tread Vance, um, when we developed this bill. and. I was very intimately involved and worked closely with the executive branch in its development. It was spawned by a multi-year effort driven by the community in a way that I thought was one of the most impressive that I've seen since I've been around. And we need the community's engagement to tackle really challenging issues to be able to collaborate effectively with government. And if we wrote this in a way that was too confusing or didn't get it right, um, then obviously it's something that we need to own and acknowledge and move forward now that we have the information that's on the ground. But I don't want there to be the impression that there was some 
thing beyond just our intent to help what everybody agrees uh, solve a very complex issue that, that we've all agreed is broken to some degree. So I know we're going to move forward. Um, I know that we've got clear steps. Both committees will remain committed to this work and make sure that this continues to be a priority. Um, we do, as Councilmember Sales just said very beautifully, want to be partners. Uh, and we have our own sphere of influence, not just through legislation, but through our personal and professional contacts that I think could be very helpful here too. So thank you all very much for the commitment, the work, um, and we know it's ongoing. It's not going to stop until we are able to say with absolute assurance that we have been able to serve all of our children. Thank you. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, I, I started us off with saying, you know, hey, what's, go what's happening, what's not with the legislation, who's doing what. We heard that theme throughout everyone here. Um, I appreciate Ms. Tred Vance, I appreciate Ms. Otero, Ms. Resnick, our MCPS partners, everybody, HHS, OMB, I know we all care. Uh, I would just like to highlight, like, when we come back, whether it's an MOU, I, I don't really care personally what it is. MOU sounds like it could be a good, a good vehicle, but if it's you in a room with the two post-it notes and you have all the duties and you, you know, you guys cross it off and, and come to an, but it has to happen. It, it has to happen. And we're clearly not there. Um, that's, that's very clear. Um, God bless you. And, you know, you know, when you look at, for example, and you mentioned this, Ms. Resnick, ECEI's priorities are alignment, sustainability, access, and affordability and expansion. COA's priorities are access, quality, workforce, supports, and family engagement, right? You're like, okay, we got, we got to figure out, you know, a couple of them line up, but not perfectly. And there's a ton in, um, below each of those buckets, right, of, of the work and the sub work and the committees that, that are happening. Uh, MCPS, you know, you're using uh, the, uh, four, the the s different percentage of poverty numbers in, in some instances than what others have cited. We can't, like, we th that has to be aligned. It just, you know, you know what I mean? And, and, and so, and you have requirements from the state, so then, then we have to, well, we, it just has to be in a way that we're presenting it as here's what's happening, right? You know, and so we, we got to work we got to work together to get to get to that point. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate Councilmember Mink bringing up the, the the data point of what we got today. You know, for example, there, there we could have gone down a rabbit hole on the KRAs, right? Like, where's the disaggregation on that? Uh, the KRAs themselves, it's a one-time test that lists English learners as a, a risk group for readiness, right? The majority of our school system are heading that way. It are the, the kids coming in are English learners. And the test that assess their readiness says that them being English lear learners is a deficit to them being where they might be literate in their home language, right? So that's another state thing, right? Potentially that we need to hear from you on how to change. So there's a lot of here that, to Dara's point, there's a lot of work to do uh, and we just need to be aligned. Um, so can I, can we get a commitment that, you know, we'll come back as a joint committee. I think when we come back, you know, especially ahead of this big study, the cost of care study, that's going to determine a lot of what we do next. And that's going to require us to go to taxpayers and say, for those 35,000, you know, for the 75,000. Again, I want every child here, as we all do, to have access to high quality infants and toddlers, early child care and education. But for whatever, however we're going to stage it, and I agree those 35,000 are really important. You know, I did math. If you take 35,000 times 24,000, it's $840 million. Okay, let's say the state takes care of half of it. It's, you know, that's, that's half a billion dollars. I don't know what the numbers are going to be, but if we're going to put ourselves on a path through whatever means we get that money, we we need coordination on what the path is. Would everyone agree with that? Okay. So when we come back, let you know, and to Ms. Yao too, we have to. I don't. We we don't. We shouldn't be seeing cross-cutting priorities. It should be the same. 
we should be seeing who's doing what. Now, you're all working together. People will take the lead on things. Absolutely. That makes sense. If the legislation is wrong and, or is not workable practically, regardless of what we, you know, then talk to us about that, too. Um, it was a, it was a well-intentioned, as Councilmember Alvin said, effort to, years-long effort, to culminate into a coordinating entity with our private sector partners, with government. Of course, there's going to be disagreements on, you know, what the legislation said, and there always will be that. But it's, it is what it is now, so we have to move forward. Um, and if, it's, if it needs to be adjusted, we, we, you know, we want to hear from you on that. But the work cannot, it has to be coordinated. And you've done a lot of work, and I appreciate you, Mr. Evans, saying that. Uh, and this is not to undermine that, but we just, for, what, well, for what's to come, we're going to need total alignment, right? So, um, Ms. Yao, is there anything else we, at, at this point? No. Okay. Uh, 430, yeah, and it's 431. I said we would stop at 430. Um, and I know I appreciate colleagues. We'll, we will come back to this, uh, but thank you for your work. Thank you for staying for three hours. And uh, when we come back, I know we'll hear about better alignment. Okay. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you.